Hello, ladies. If you know what that's a reference to, go ahead and leave a super chat telling me. Um, so, Sean will not be able to join us tonight. He's feeling under the weather, but I'm here, and it's a Roman topic, so we'll still be good to go. Tonight, we'll be looking at a number of people from the First Triumvirate period, I got a little ambitious when I made the list, so we actually won't go through everyone I have on it. We'll save a few people for the second triumvirate list, since looking at it now, I see that it'd be better to wait. There's not really much compelling reason to cover such people now. So before I show you my list, what I'd like to do is just do a simple sound check. Is there a thing coming through? And the other thing I have to tell you is because Sean's not here, the big problem will be that I will not really be able to keep track of Super Chats. So next week what we'll do is look at any of the Super Chats that came in for this stream. But does anyone have any trouble hearing me? Is the mic being weird or anything? Let me know now before we switch over to the uh, list. So let's take a quick look at the list. Here it is. And I've replaced S tier with Deified, since that was the highest honor that a person from this period received. Only one person got that honor. And in lieu of an F tier, we have the Head in a Box tier, which was also only a punishment for one person, Although the person who received that punishment actually will not end up in that tier because it was a pretty unfitting end for him. Although it would have been a perfectly fine end for a number of the people we'll talk about. Here I have 28 people listed. Some of them you can probably recognize. Some of them I had to get a little bit creative with uh, because there aren't all that many images for Romans who aren't either very famous or were lucky enough to run a mint at some point in their career. But what we'll do is go through most of them. I think we'll go through about 22 or 23 of them, rank them accordingly, and see where we end up. And the people who don't get covered on this one will roll over to the second triumvirate list, which we will cover at some point in the future. You can probably see some people you recognize here. I'm sure the first three are people you recognize. And I'm sure you also recognize this guy. So, let's check again to make sure everything is still good to go. Alright, well, let's go back and take a look at these illustrious, and in many cases, not so illustrious individuals. First up we have the first... I, I think it's safe to call him the first member of the First Triumvirate. When the First Triumvirate started, Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, or Pompey the Great, was easily the most influential member of the group. If we think about his career prior to forming the First Triumvirate, he was very much the first man in Rome. He first achieved his fame by serving under his father during the Social War, and he gained enough standing among his father's men that they were willing to follow him when he called upon them to serve in Sulla's cause. So when Sulla came back from the east and fought against Carbo, who was now the leader of the Marian faction, Pompey raised up his father's veterans, they marched in, and they played a pivotal role in defeating the Marians. Pompey was so well regarded by Sulla that Sulla effectively exempted him from the curse of Norum, which meant that while everybody else had to wait until they attained a certain age and they had to fulfill other requirements such as holding an office before holding a more senior office, Pompey was effectively given an exemption from the whole system. And effectively, Sulla had to do that because Pompey was too powerful and had done him too many favors. And this meant that Pompey would attain great wealth, fame, and glory at an early age. So politically, he started out as effectively an optimate. And I think that he very much identified as such until right around the time he formed the first triumvirate. It took him a long time to realize that his peers were growing jealous of him for all of his deeds. 
Um, another fun anecdote I guess we can go into is that he and Solo were talking and Solo was effectively trying to threaten him a little bit and tell, tell him to know his place. I'm in charge right now, you'll have your day, but it's not now. And Pompey, young and brash, turned to him and said, More men worship the rising sun than the setting sun. Over time, Pompey would mellow, but he still had a lot of swagger about him even in his older years. So, going into 60, Pompey had done things that few other Romans had done. He had fought in most of the major wars in some capacity that Rome had fought over the last 20 years, and with a few exceptions, he had done extraordinarily well. The one time, the only real time he got exposed was fighting Quintus Sertorius in Spain. And Sertorius was a brilliant general who used terrain exceptionally well, and it showed that Pompey was not a polished tactician. That was not a defect that he ever made good, by the way. What Pompey did do extraordinarily well was organization, strategy, and operations. When it came to tactical stuff, he was a little weak, and we'll see that this will come back to haunt him again at Pharsalus. So, Pompey got embarrassed a couple times by Sertorius, but ultimately he and his colleague Metellus Pius prevailed. He then went and snatched the glory from Crassus for defeating Spartacus by killing a few men fleeing the battle that Crassus had won. He also took up the Mithridatic War. This was the third or fourth one, I can never recall which, and he's the guy who actually finished Mithridates once and for all. And he did this by stealing his command from Lucullus. Lucullus, I probably should have put him on this list, but the fact is that the man had more or less retired going into this period. So he pretty much gave up on politics and would only appear from time to time. So that's probably why I forgot to include him. He probably should have been here. That's my oversight. Um, so Pompey, though, it didn't occur to him that by stealing credit from everybody else, he was alienating people, and that the Romans, especially the more conservative faction, tended to very much look down upon the idea of one person being so prominent. And because of that, he sort of ousted himself from the Optimate faction. In the year 60, he came back from the east. He had conquered not only Mithridates, but he acquired a lot of other land as well. He had intimidated the Parthians, he had ended the Seleucid Empire, and he had also acquired Judea, thus ending the Hasmonean era. So, he was one of the most accomplished Romans in history already by the year 60. Even if he had died at that moment, he would still be an extraordinarily influential figure. Another thing to keep in mind is that in 67, he had actually held a pirate command where he was given an overarching authority called Maius Imperium, which means greater uh, authority. And this had given him command of all Roman troops within 50 miles of every coast. And he had wrapped up the pirate command in only three months. But legally, this idea of a commander-in-chief who has authority over everything is something that became a very important part of being emperor in the time of Augustus. So, um, by this point we can see all Pompey's characteristics. He's about in his mid-40s, but unlike most guys who were looking to go out and win glory at that time, Pompey's ready to come back to Rome and kick it and enjoy the good life after doing so much for Rome. And it takes him a while to figure out that his former colleagues are pissed at him. So, by the end of 60, after his veterans haven't been settled and they're growing restive, and after his eastern conquests are kind of just being put off by the Senate, Pompey's getting pissed. And he meets with Caesar and Crassus, and they form the first triumvirate. This is significant because Pompey and Crassus don't like each other, um, and then Caesar brings less to the table than the two of them do. But... They form a political alliance where they will control junior magistrates and get their agendas passed. It's sent up to Caesar to get the agenda passed. He does. And Pompey remains in Rome for most of the 50s, kind of being the main power broker there. But he's not super effective in that role. Now, he's pretty damn effective at getting people elected because he's wildly popular with the people. Um, now, there are periods where he's a little less popular, but for the most part, his name recognition and his, his deeds are such that people love him. 
But one thing he's not really able to do is to control, say, Clodius. Or to control Milo, because by the time that Milo is really rising to prominence, Pompey has a foot in both camps. And in fact, I'll argue that Pompey always had a foot in both camps. Because again, remember his origins. What ends up happening is that in 53 or 52, he ended up being elected as an interrex to oversee a period of turmoil in Rome. And this was following hard upon the heels of Crassus being defeated at Carai in the east. So there's now only, now the triumvirate's sort of over because there are only two people. Uh, and you can't really, by definition, have a triumvirate with two people. And he also has the problem that uh, his wife, who was Caesar's daughter, had died. And Caesar offered him to find another woman in his family, uh, but Pompey said, no, I'm grieving too much, I can't do that. Uh, because actually Pompey and Julia had been very much in love. But Pompey had had wives before her, and he was a man who seems to have fallen in love fairly easily. And it turns out that he had a colleague in the Senate who inexplicably had a hot daughter. And that colleague was Metellus Scipio. So uh, Pompey and Metellus Scipio had been working together at this time because they're both pretty senior. Then they are elected consuls together. And at that time, Pompey marries Metellus' daughter. Now Caesar worries about this, but Pompey tells him, Oh, it's just a marriage. Don't think too much of it. I'm not turning my back on you. But in fact, Pompey was beginning to grow jealous. After several years of inactivity, he's no longer comfortable with Caesar getting all this praise for the Gallic War. Because many people are saying that Caesar's victories are more difficult than the ones that he did. Because the Romans have this idea that people in the East are weak, effeminate, whereas people in the West are stronger and more martial. So there are people effectively saying that Caesar is a better general, and Caesar is more of a man, and this, that, and the other. And Pompey is slowly but surely getting pissed off about that. Also, we have to keep in mind that the Optimates went from effectively opposing everything that he did to praising him and asking them, asking him to save the Republic and praising his abilities and talking about how great he is. This also, as we'll see, comes at a time when the Optimates had been without a real leader for a long time. And uh, you know what? They might have hated Pompey for a while, but he's a leader, so he's got that going for him. So anyway, um, Pompey starts to really gravitate toward the Optimates. As Caesar's command in Gaul ends, Pompey shows where his cards are by withdrawing two of the legions he had loaned to Caesar. So Caesar's army went from ten legions to eight. That being said, Caesar very much still held the balance of power in his hands. He had eight legions, and he could use probably five or so of them outside of Gaul, because he had to leave some behind to hold Gaul. And these are hardened legions who were desperately loyal to Caesar. So Pompey should have had the military sense to realize that you can't really do an effective ultimatum when the situation is that Caesar has a powerful army on the border and you have basically nothing at hand. But Pompey listened to his new father-in-law, Metellus Scipio, and the other morons who surrounded him. So Pompey backed the idea of issuing an ultimatum to Caesar, that he had to come home and face trial before being elected to anything or getting another command. Caesar said that was unacceptable, and while, legally speaking, I could see how somebody would be outraged that Caesar would defy law and order, I mean, that makes sense as a position, but at the same time, because of the way that power operated in Rome, and because how, of how the legions were loyal to generals rather than the Republic, it just was not smart to piss off generals in this way, especially when Caesar gave you the terms by which he'd be placated. So anyway... Um, the Senate ends up at war with Caesar. Caesar, of course, crosses the Rubicon. Pompey can't do anything about it and has to withdraw to Greece. There he's given the leisure to raise an army because Caesar opts to go after Spain where there are five legions loyal to Pompey under two of his oldest generals. 
Uh, we'll come back to those generals at a later time. Suffice it now for say that Caesar was not impressed by them. Although, as we'll also see, those generals actually had pretty good careers prior to that point. So anyway, Pompey raises his army in Greece, and while it's not as um, it's not as veteran as Caesar's, he does have some of his old vets who, while they're getting older now, most of them would have to at least be 40. Um, they are still effective enough to train the new men, so these are very good legions, very well equipped. They're just a little less experienced and battle-hardened than Caesar's troops. It's worth noting, throughout the campaign in Greece, Pompey consistently outgeneraled Caesar. Um, might be a controversial statement, but think about what happened. So, Caesar crosses the Adriatic in his ships, which was a risk in itself because there was a fleet. He pulls that off. Then he gets trapped at the coastal port of Dyrrhachium. He tries to do a siege operation with Pompey, but Pompey's men are more numerous, so they are better able to dig trenches, even though they're less experienced. And then he gets Antony's reinforcements. That is a very close-run thing. They march to the interior, and despite the incompetence of Metellus Scipio, who was leading a detachment, Pompey is still able to corner Caesar at Pharsalus. He's got Caesar trapped. Caesar's outnumbered two to one. It's a wrap. The only way Caesar can try to break out is through a frontal assault on Pompey's fortified camp. There's no way in hell that would work, especially given the numbers. Caesar's men are starving. They have no food. But then, and Pompey knows this. Pompey knows that he's won. It's over. Yet, Pompey listens to the men in camp who effectively tell him, if you don't fight Caesar in the field and defeat him in the open, you're not a true Roman. You're a little bitch. So Pompey responds to the schoolyard taunt by fighting Caesar in the open and giving him a punching chance of winning. And as we all know, Caesar did win. Caesar won this battle. That should never have been fought. This was the one mistake Pompey made other than allowing Metellus Scipio to command a detachment. And this is what cost him the entire campaign and arguably his life. After this point, Pompey flees to Egypt. Here, the king Ptolemy XII was somebody that Pompey thought he could rely upon because one of his guys, Gabinius, had actually helped to establish Ptolemy XII on the throne. However, the Egyptians realized that Pompey was losing and so they wanted to appease Caesar, and they knew Caesar would be hot on his heels. So they cut Pompey's head off, put it in a box, and presented it to Caesar as a gift. When Caesar received the gift, he wept, and he was angry at the Egyptians for killing a Roman magistrate that way. He felt like it was an unworthy end for his former son-in-law. And uh, thus began Caesar's time in Egypt, which we'll come back to when we get to Caesar. Um... If this was a lifetime ranking for Pompey, he's an easy S tier, or deified tier, because the guy has more achievements than almost any other Roman, even accounting for the failures that he had in this period. Even when you balance it out that way, he's still an easy deified tier. If we're just ranking him on this era, however, I think A is about the limit. Um, because he does mostly control Roman politics. And he does manage to keep his ego under control for a very long time, right up until the death of Crassus and the death of Julia. And had he had just a little bit more sense at the end, before Caesar crossed the Rubicon, he could have kept the peace, and then Caesar could have gone and tried to avenge Crassus. There wouldn't have been a civil war. Pompey remains home in Rome, probably still the number one man in the empire, because Caesar most likely would have died out east. Caesar, by this point, was also getting older. His uh, epilepsy was getting worse. So, the Civil War was avoidable, and not enough people blame Pompey for that. People usually blame either Caesar or someone like Cato, but the guy best positioned to prevent any of this from happening was Pompey, and he, he failed to. So I'm going to go with an A for Pompey. Uh, another thing to keep in mind that is impressive about Pompey is that after 10 years of inactivity, the guy was in his 50s, he was out of shape, he was a little heavier, 
but he still managed to command very effectively, got himself back in shape, got his men ready for war, and they were able to hold their own against Caesar's veteran legions who had literally conquered an area that the Romans had previously thought to be more or less unassailable. So Pompey is still very impressive in this period, even if it's not quite his prime. And as a politician, when it comes to Pompey, it's easy to say that he wasn't as adept as someone like Caesar, and that's true, but Pompey definitely does have political talent. Make no mistake about it. As I mentioned, he's very popular. He's an okay orator. He's not the best, but he also can keep a crowd entertained. And he's also very good at making people think that he likes them more than he actually does, which is an important skill. Uh, we'll talk about that more when we look at Cicero, who m much of whose career was orbiting Pompey as an adoring fanboy. Next up, we have Marcus Licinius Crassus, or as he is sometimes known as, the man who needed a laxative. First, let's check our audio, make sure everything's still good. Come on. All right, looks like we're still good. All right, so, Crassus. Crassus's family was pretty well positioned in Roman politics. His, I would say for the last three generations leading up to his lifetime, his family had been among the most elite in Rome. It was either his grandfather or his great uncle was the greatest orator of his generation and someone who had influenced Cicero pretty heavily. So it should come as no surprise that Crassus played a prominent part in Roman politics. A lot of people make him out as the money man who was almost a parvenu I don't know where that idea comes from that you see in a few popular histories, but it's complete nonsense. Um, Crassus came from as distinguished a family as anybody else, more so than almost any, most people. Um, and he also, just like Pompey, started his career as a follower of Sulla. So while oftentimes it's portrayed as a, uh, the first triumvir is portrayed as sort of a union of the populares versus the optimates, in reality, it's a lot more complicated than that, as neither Pompey nor Crassus was ever clearly a popularis. Both of them flirted with it, but neither of them were truly members of that group, or truly embraced that idea. It was really only Caesar who was the popularis. These other guys were just willing to flirt with it. So Crassus, the other thing, uh, so let's look at his early career for just a minute. Um, so when Sulla initially marched on Rome in 88, so the first time, Crassus came out to support him. And because of this, he was a marked man when old Marius came back. So he had to flee to Spain. He raised about a half-strength legion there. And then he fled from that point to Sulla's army in Greece. Sulla really received him warmly and thanked him for his service and promised him the world. He said, you're my new golden boy, and your dedication to what is noble and right is unmatched. I'll make sure that you rise high. So now he lands with Sulla in Italy only to find that another young man had the same idea, but did it more effectively. So in Sulla's mind, Pompey has stolen his thunder and stolen his place in uh, Sulla's heart. Because Crassus had a much smaller army than the one that Pompey raised. And it was also not as good. Uh, Pompey achieved quite a bit more in the Second Civil War than uh, Crassus did. And they actually fought side by side at one point. So Sulla also endeared himself to Crassus. Uh, Crassus also endeared himself to Sulla. But he got outshone. And because of this, Crassus developed a lifelong hatred and jealousy uh, regarding Pompey. Crassus did not get exempted from the curse of the Norum, but he still benefited immensely from Sulla's victory. During the prescriptions, he made a lot more wealth by basically killing people who held land and real estate he wanted, and then he took it. And then he resold it, or built stuff on it. He was notorious as a slumlord. Uh, he would build really cheap apartments and rent them out, and a lot of times if there was a minor earthquake, they would collapse and kill people. But because there was literally zero accountability for the wealthy in the Roman Republic, this never led to any prosecutions. 
And in fact, as I said, Crassus actually kind of played a bit of a popularis at times, so no one would think of him as being as much of a snob as, say, Cato, even though Crassus was immensely wealthier. By about 70 or so, Crassus was the wealthiest man in Rome. He wouldn't hold this forever, but for a time, he was the wealthiest man in Rome. And this enabled him to raise an army, a private army, to fight Spartacus during the Third Servile War from 73 to 70. He won the war, but his generalship was a bit iffy. He was okay. He did enough, but keep in mind he's facing an enemy with no clear leader, despite it being called Spartacus's revolt. There was another leader who was a Gaul. I can't remember his name right offhand, but he was at least as important. And there were, uh, was it Praxis or Craxus? I can't remember his name. Anyway, uh, there were other leaders as well who went off and did their own thing. So Spartacus did not have unified command. His men were not formally trained. He had a mix of gladiators and field hands. So defeating Spartacus ultimately is actually not that impressive. Crassus did it, and it helped uh, secure the peace in Italy, but he did lose some of the credit when Pompey came home early and defeated some stragglers. So this once again made him an enemy of Pompey. In 70, they were elected together as consul, so each of them held consulships at the same time. And this was not a harmonious union. Uh, actually, it, act, it came damn close to another civil war in 70, because both of them so distrusted the other that they actually refused to demobilize their forces at first, and each one of them had armies outside the city waiting and ready to go. So they eventually did kind of make peace a little bit, but even after they shook hands, they still butted heads constantly, and effectively nothing got done that year. What's interesting is that Pompey took the more popularist stance at this time, and he wanted to actually restore the power of the tribunes, which was a key part of the Solon constitutional reforms. Crassus held firm about that point and won the day, but ultimately, of course, the power of the tribunes was restored. And, ironically enough, Pompey and Crassus would work together to really try to exploit that to the maximum. Although at this time, Crassus is holding to his old principles against uh, tribunes. During the 60s, Crassus by now is a senior member of the Senate. He's still known for being generous and for appearing in court for people because he actually was a pretty good orator. Some of the people often forget about him. And he's especially good at forensic oratory because he was really good at remembering details. So you can remember details of murder cases and extortion cases and all that. Crassus... Um, became Caesar's chief financial backer. Caesar was not well-to-do at this time, at least by the standards of a senator, and needed money to win elections. Crassus was willing to provide that money. So Crassus really gets close to Caesar because of that. Uh, Crassus was possibly linked to Catiline as well, at least according to his detractors. And uh, because of Crassus's links with Caesar, that's part of the other reason why he's often accused of being a popularist, but in Rome, politics can be pretty complicated. And there are a number of different reasons, some familial, some ideological, some strictly personal, that drive things. And it's really hard to pin down any one reason why Roman politics works the way that it does. Even money doesn't explain everything, even though money does explain a lot of things in Rome. So... Crassus is convinced by Caesar to form an alliance with Pompey. For Crassus, this is the biggest sacrifice of the three of them. Caesar will get to be consul out of this. Pompey gets his veterans settled and gets to hang out in Rome and enjoy his glory. Crassus gets by far the least. And although he's often seen as the money man of the triumvirate, by this point, because of his eastern campaigns, Pompey's actually a little richer. So Crassus is the second man in the triumvirate, at risk of becoming the third, if Caesar were to say, get a big command and then kick a lot of ass. But of course, that's just a hypothetical, right? So, Crassus is the second man in the triumvirate. He does his role. He does it pretty well. He helps them to 
get people elected. He helps to fund campaigns. He helps to direct the tribunes. And he and Pompey get along pretty well, actually. And he also serves as a bit of a peacemaker at Lucca, if memory serves me correct. However, as he watched Caesar conquer Gaul, and he realized that of the triumvirs he is now the third, he started to yearn for military glory before he got too old to take the field. So he recalled his son from Caesar's army, where he had been one of the best legates, and together they raised a host to go east and try to conquer Parthia. Crassus had all kinds of way out of, out of this war. The Parthians were willing to make a lot of concessions, but that wasn't the point. Crassus was there not because he was provoked, but because he simply wanted to conquer something. He was also offered a lot of aid from Armenia, a longtime enemy of the Parthians. The king of Armenia said, If you march north through my territory, I will give you 20,000 men and logistical support, and you avoid the flatlands where the Parthian mounted archers are best. So, let's do that. Crassus said, fuck that. I'm marching straight in. Let's just take the beeline. I don't need your help. Thanks, but no thanks. And he also, predictably, does not recruit enough horsemen. He eventually, of course, is heavily defeated at Karai. First he loses his son, and then he himself dies. His troops then fall back slaughtered and great disarray to Syria. The situation is only rescued by a young man named Gaius Cassius Longinus, one of his senior legates. Um, Crassus is best known for his defeat at Karai, and I think that this does show his greatest weakness, that he was a poor general. It is to his credit, however, that he did fight bravely. Crassus was not a coward. He also had the ability to inspire his men and to keep them together. Even when things were dire, Crassus, and after he had learned of his son's death, possibly because the Parthians threw his son's head at him, uh, Crassus kept his shit together and tried his best. So I have to give him some credit for that. And in fact, cowardice was fairly unusual among the leaders of antiquity. Even the, the dumbest of the dumb and the weakest of the weak could face death bravely. However, Karai is a huge fuck-up, and in my opinion, at least, Crassus kind of got exploited a bit when he joined the Triumvirate. Because clearly Caesar and Pompey were just willing, were just looking to tap into his pockets. And that's effectively what they did. Crassus didn't get nearly as much out of this as the other two. I can't put his head in a box, but I do have to put him as an E. I don't think Crassus was that great of a triumvir. In fact, and this is a hot take, if we had to rank all six triumvirs, Crassus is six out of six. He's below Lepidus. Anyway. Before we move on to Caesar, quick sound check. And after we get past Caesar, the pace will pick up a bit because, of course, most of these guys are not as good, or at least as well-known, as uh, the first three. Okay. Now we move on to a gentleman named Gaius Julius Caesar. I'm not going to go through all the details of his career. I think it is well enough known. I do plan on doing a series about him for Romans of Renown. It'll probably be five parts at least because of how much we know about Caesar and how important he is. Uh, suffice to say for now, he was born in 100 BCE. And his, in many ways, is a comeback story. So his family is patrician, which means that they have been eligible for the Senate since the foundation of the Republic and that they were even settled in Rome prior to the Republic. However... His family had not seen a consul in at least 100 years. I think maybe even 200 years. His family had been, had been, I guess, embarrassed or impoverished for a while. And when I say impoverished, I don't mean that they were fighting for scraps or that even they were forced to have jobs. But they were not wealthy enough to partake in politics at a high level. Um, Caesar, his father, actually got elected the praetor. So the comeback actually began in the generation before Caesar. But Caesar's father fell ill and died before he could run for consul. At the time, Caesar was 15, and probably he was inspired by his father's example to go into politics and try to strive for glory for the sake of his family. So we might think that Caesar would lean heavily on his patrician heritage, 
After all, Sola had done that. But Caesar grew up as a teenager and young man under Sola, and he had a familial relationship with Gaius Marius, because Marius was married to his aunt. It was common for wealthy plebeians to marry impoverished patricians, so that way the one gets money that they need, the other gets the pedigree and the clout. So the guy Caesar will invoke the most is actually Gaius Marius, the new man. And this will be an effective strategy. Caesar has a ready-made following from early in his career because of his relationship with Marius. And because of the age gap between them, it's likely that Marius never really got to know him that well. I'm sure I'm sure he knew him and knew his name, but I doubt that Marius would have really been able to tell you all about Caesar's characteristics or anything like that. In many ways, it's kind of like the relationship between Caesar and Octavian, where they know each other, but Caesar probably didn't know what Octavian would do with his inheritance. So Caesar plays this up for his entire career, and even though he's very junior, he becomes the leader of the shattered popularist faction such as it is. Uh, And it's worth noting that, yes, after Sola, that faction is in tatters. But it still has a following among the people, and there's still some vitality to it, even if it has been largely extirpated at the top levels. So, Caesar has that going for him. He also is known for his oratory. Despite the fact that he did not put nearly as much effort into his speeches as, say, Cicero... A lot of people considered him to be the second or third best orator in Rome at the time. He's certainly better than Pompey or Crassus. And really, it's a question of whether Caesar or Hortentius was number two. And that largely depends on your preference for style. Caesar was very pure and brief. Whereas Hortensius was very long-winded and kind of over the top. Whichever style you prefer, that's your number two. But then the number three is kind of a given based on which person you rejected for number two. So he's really good at that, and really for most of his career he's actually known as a politician, not as a general. Now he does have some martial deeds early in his career. He won a distinction at a battle. He worked as an envoy in Bithynia. He uh, famously killed some pirates. He did some other stuff, but mostly he's known as a really good politician. Someone who's very good at getting people inspired and giving speeches and doing things like that. It's only in his late 30s when we really get an indication that Caesar is is a remarkable soldier. So he will be elected praetor, and then he will go, after his term as praetor, to Lusitania, which is basically Portugal. And here he defeats enough of the locals to earn a triumph. At some point during his stay in the East, he found a statue of Alexander the Great, or in the West, excuse me. And he wept because he realized that at this point he's in his late 30s, and Alexander had conquered the world by the time he's in his late 20s. So he wept knowing he will never equal Alexander. And he probably thought this might, and there was a good chance, based on the way Roman politics worked and how commands were never guaranteed the consuls and proconsuls, that this little triumph on the edge of the world would be his only military glory for his whole life. So Caesar was depressed by that thought. And he had no indication that he would one day go on to do all the things he did. So he comes home in the year 60. Maybe 61, I can't recall which one. It had to be 60, actually, because he wants to run for the consulship in 59. Well, by this point, because of his popularist leanings... He has really attracted the attention of the Optimates, and we'll talk about the guy in particular who really targets Caesar a little later on. So, the Senate tells him effectively, okay, because you were late getting home, you have a choice. You can either celebrate your triumph, or you can run for consul, but you can't do both. If you decide to celebrate your triumph, you'll have to wait until next year to run for consul. Caesar is not hearing that, and he's not having it, so he actually said, okay, I won't do a triumph. I want to be consul. And similar, uh, at least, uh, no one else had had to deal with that kind of bullshit. Everyone else had been accorded a triumph if they had earned one. 
but Caesar was being obstructed because of who he was. This pisses him off, and this is one of the reasons why he goes and seeks out Pompey and Crassus. We don't know for sure which one of them had the idea for the triumvirate. I think most people assume it was Caesar, simply because he, in time, will prove to be the most astute of the three. Um, but yeah, he, he clearly wanted to be consul, and he wanted Pompey's support. I don't know how well they knew each other going into this, but he did know Crassus pretty well. So he figured, okay, I can become Pompey's good friend if I get his settlement passed. I'm a much better politician than... Afranius, who was the consul in 60, who was supposed to do Pompey's bidding and failed. So he goes to Pompey, offers that up, and makes them makes Pompey and Crassus reconcile, and then Caesar marry or Caesar has his daughter marry Pompey. So now they are the first triumvirate, and they recruit a whole host of other magistrates to back them up, including Caesar's cousin, who's actually senior to him. We'll talk about him later. Um, so yeah, now they have this whole structure in place. And it is not a strictly ideological coalition. Because remember, in Roman terms, Caesar is a popularist, he's on the left, but Pompey and Crassus are more centrist or even center-right. So this is a coalition. So anyway, Caesar serves as consul in 59, and his time in office is a bit of a doozy. He has to resort to some strong-arm tactics to get Pompey's legislation passed. His colleague was Bibulus, and basically Bibulus was following the playbook of Metellus Calaire, who was the leader of the Optimates at the time. And the idea here is to obstruct everything that your opponents try to do, no matter what. And the best way to obstruct in Rome at this time was to invoke religion. So if all public business had to be approved by the gods, and it had to be under the right auspices. So, if you say, oh, well, I'm an auger, and I don't think the gods are pleased. I just saw a bird. We have to cancel business today. That's what happened. Business would get canceled, everything gets shut down. Caesar was able to deal with this because, a few years earlier, he had stunned Rome by becoming Pontifex Maximus, even though he was only in his late 30s, and a praetor. So that pissed off the conservatives pretty badly. And in fact, one of the guys he beat out was none other than Metellus Calaire, who held a big grudge. So uh, Caesar at first went to the Senate and tried to get the legislation passed, but uh, Metellus Calaire literally walked out with the Optimates. Uh, when Bibulus tried to oppose him in the Senate, Caesar basically hired a gang to harass him, so Bibulus had to stay home. Bibulus would then send messages to the Senate and say the auspices were bad. And Caesar would say, I'm Pontifex Maximus, you're full of shit. They're not. Um, so after his attempt to work with the Senate got shot down, he went to the People's Assembly, just like Tiberius Gracchus had, and he passed all of Pompey's legislation. This put a huge target on his back, however, because the Senate remembered how their fathers and grandfathers had killed previous popularities for doing similar stuff. So from this point forward, they want to kill Caesar at all cost. They believe that he has violated the Mos Maiorum and that he must die for it. So this is why, despite him conquering Gaul, bringing home all kinds of glory and wealth and adding to Rome and doing all that, there were people who were not willing to allow him to come home and be consul and then go conquer the East. They wanted his head on a plate because they were so pissed that he had overturned a couple of generations of precedent and gotten away with it. Uh, so Caesar made some real enemies in this time. In terms of his skills, Caesar is very charismatic, but also he could be a dick. Um, Caesar was known for having affairs with uh, other people's significant others, which was not uncommon but Caesar seems to have done it a little bit more than most. He does have some really shining moments, however. So during the Catalinarian Conspiracy, both he and Crassus were being accused of being in league with Catiline, especially by Cato the Younger. So Cato actually went to Caesar and said, I saw Caesar get a note, which couldn't have been too uncommon because these guys passed notes or received messages from home. And Cato said, I see Caesar reading a note. He's clearly in league with Catiline. I demand that this note be read out loud. 
And embarrassingly for Cato, it was a note from Cato's sister thanking Caesar for the good time they had had the night before. Uh, so, yeah, Caesar had his moments. So, in Gaul, uh, he eventually gets a proconsular command. At first, he was supposed to be assigned to rural Italy, but people pulled some strings. He got Cisalpine Gaul, which is okay. So that's basically the Italian side of the Alps. Then the governor of Transalpine Gaul died, and his friends back in Rome pulled more strings. The tribunes, I mean. And he got Transalpine Gaul as well. So now he's finally in a position to earn some glory and to try to live out his dream of being Alexander. And he does basically start the Gallic War. Now, of course, in his own commentaries, he talks about how he had to go intervene. He didn't. He just simply intervened on his own against the Helvetians. And then from there, went on to fight the rest of the Gauls. Over the next ten years, he amassed an army of up to ten legions. And he committed a pretty well-documented genocide. By his own account, he killed one-third of the Gauls, enslaved another third, and left the last third free. So, Caesar, you might think this is something that the Roman people would be a little bit unhappy with, that they might be unhappy that he had gone and genocided their neighbors. But in fact, they're ecstatic. And the reason is, the Gauls are the boogeymen of Roman history, because of the sack of Rome under Brennus. So because of that, Caesar is now a folk hero. Another thing that really helps him is that he did two things during this campaign that no one thought possible. One is that he crossed the Rhine on a bridge his engineers built. So that's a great engineering feat, and it shows the power and glory of Rome, as well as just showing Caesar's boldness. So he marched into Rome, marched through the forest, and really just expanded Rome's horizons more than ever. Then, a couple times, he actually landed in Britain, including one time where he actually landed against an opposing force. Uh, and the reason that he went to Britain is because some of the Gallic tribes had a presence in both Britain and in Gaul. So, up to this point, there actually were people who denied that Britain was real. As stupid as that sounds, that was a real position that people held. Now, there had been both Greek and Phoenician merchants who had traveled all the way to Britain and they knew it was real, but there were people back at home who looked at old maps and the text of old geographers and said, no, you're wrong. There's no such thing. So Caesar effectively expanded Rome's horizons in the intellectual sense as well. He defeats a massive uprising after his conquest by a man named Vercingetorix, and uh, during this campaign, we see that while Caesar is a pretty good strategist, his real genius is in tactics and in really being able to read the moment and seize opportunities. So, uh, he almost died a number of times in Gaul, but doesn't. Now we get to 49. His campaign's his, uh, tenure in office is expiring, and the Senate issues an ultimatum. Caesar has men back in Rome who are on his side, some of whom he literally just bought uh, because he won fabulous wealth selling all the slaves, and now his wealth is up there with Pompey and all the rest. So, effectively, his position is, I, I'm not doing a trial because I know it will be rigged. I'm going to come home, I'm going to serve as consul, and confirm what I did in Gaul. Then I'm going east, and I'll probably die because I'm getting old. I have no interest in overthrowing the Senate, I have no interest in... Uh, being dictator or anything like that. You guys are being paranoid. I just want to win glory. I'm the second coming of Alexander. This is what would have happened if Alexander hadn't died at the age of 33. So just let me be me. And the Senate says, fuck you, you're facing a trial because of 59. So they were at loggerheads. No one could make peace in this situation, except for Pompey, of course, who doesn't. So Caesar crosses the Rubicon, which of course, now becomes sort of a metaphor for going past the point of no return. And Pompey can't resist him in Italy because he doesn't have enough men. Pompey flees to Greece. So now Caesar has to choose. Do I go west against what he calls the army without a general, or do I go east against the general without an army? Um, I think that that's a pretty disparaging way to describe Afranius and Petrius. Uh, but anyway, that's apparently how Caesar felt about it. 
Caesar goes to Spain. He defeats the five legions under Afranius and Petrius. We'll talk about that more later. And leaves an idiot in charge named Quintus Cassius. He then comes back to Italy, reorganizes his troops, launches the Greek campaign that we talked about a while ago, where he took a huge risk in landing where he did. Um, he was in constant supply trouble, and Pompey nearly beat him a number of times. Pompey had him trapped at Thracium, and then trapped him again at Pharsalus. Uh, Caesar tried to turn the tables after Thracium and before Pharsalus by trying to cut off Metellus Scipio and crushing him. Because just like anyone else who was alive at the time, Caesar knew that Metellus Scipio was not up to snuff. And, uh, you know, it didn't quite work out, though, because Metellus got lucky and got away. He gets trapped at Pharsalus, and then Metellus Scipio does him a solid by urging Pompey to fight. Uh, Caesar wins. He then pursues Pompey to Egypt. He has an affair with young Cleopatra VII. He puts a baby in her, Caesarian. He then... Uh, goes to the east in Syria, defeats some opponents there pretty quickly. That's where he has his famous weenie, weedy, weeky uh, quote where he says, I came, I saw, I conquered. He then goes to Africa. We'll talk about this more with Metellus Scipio, but suffice it to say that uh, Pompey's former officers raised a formidable army there. So Caesar faces the highest quality army that he faced during the Civil War, and this was a battle that easily could have gone against him, just based on the armies that were arrayed, because the Senate's army here was pretty damn good. But Metellus Scipio was in charge, so Caesar won easily. So he wins Africa, even though that should have been close, it wasn't, and now he pursues to Spain, where his old legate Quintus Cassius fucked everything up, and those troops turned against him, and then the Pompeians arrived and reinforced them. So now he fights what ends up being the hardest battle of his career because Labinus is in command. Labinus is former chief lieutenant from Gaul. So this is just a straight-up slugfest, and Caesar ultimately prevails. Um, now he comes back to Rome. He declares himself dictator for life because he knows that if he lays down his power, people will try to come after him or prosecute him or some other crap. He pardoned most of his enemies. And that was actually a problem because when you grant someone mercy or clemency, that was something that masters did for slaves in Roman society. So by giving someone your mercy, you are saying, I'm better than you, and it is by my leave that you, my inferior, may continue to live. Caesar didn't think of it that way, though. He thought that he was doing them a favor that he was being merciful, that he was being unlike Sulla, who killed his opponents. Because we have to remember, Caesar's view of politics and his view of the world was very much shaped by the environment he grew up in, which was Sulla's Rome. And he wanted to be the anti-Sulla. So even though he ended up as dictator, which was ironic and not what he wanted, he wanted to do things differently. So that's part of why he did dictator for life, because Sulla didn't do that. Um, but, on, but just like his old um, anti-mentor... Caesar didn't really have any real solutions for Rome's problems. All he knew is that he wanted to still go east and kick some Parthian ass. So he basically made some arrangements and was about to do that. But he got too lax about security, he got assassinated on the Ides of March by the men he had pardoned, and that led to another round of civil wars. But anyway, uh, Caesar after his death was deified, rightfully so, because he accomplished more than almost any other Roman in history. And unlike Pompey, he did not die a loser. So, Caesar deified. How else could you possibly do that? Does anybody actually disagree that Caesar should be deified? I'm just curious. Alright. So, next up, damn, 228 viewers, holy shit. All right. The Lex Julia is from Augustus's time. And that's a law about adultery. So, next up we have, represented by Jeb Bush by orders of Reddit, Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus. Bibulus 
had the misfortune of being an exact contemporary of Caesar. Actually, he's a couple years older, a year or two older, but he's a plebeian, so he's eligible for offices a year later than patricians, due to uh, Sulla being a patrician and favoring that. So every year when he ran for office, one of his rivals was always Julius Caesar. In many cases, because they had different statuses, they were not directly competing for election, but they would butt heads in office. So these two men don't like each other. And Bibulus felt like it was his great misfortune to be in the same cohort as Caesar, because this was not a great place to be. He'd be compared to Caesar of necessity, and he was always found wanting. He was not as talented as Caesar. So that's kind of a problem. But... Of, the other, of the, all the men in the cohort, it's worth noting that Bibulus is the only other guy in that group who was distinguished. And no one else even was thought to be remotely on Caesar's level. So that's actually kind of an argument in favor of Bibulus, that people saw him as the only guy in that class who could go up against Caesar, at least to some extent. So uh, credit where credit's due for that. Bibulus first becomes prominent in 59 when he is the plebeian consul, and he is the guy tasked with continuing obstructionism. The problem for him is that Caesar is no longer willing to abide by the rules, because now he's got the backing of Crassus and Pompey, and a whole lot of other magistrates, including a number of tribunes. So, Bibulus is intimidating and intimidated into staying home, and it got so bad with Bibulus being a stay-at-home consul that many of the comedians of the era started to refer to 59 as the consulship of Julius and Caesar because Bibulus was nowhere to be seen most of the year. Today we tend to look at Bibulus as being incredibly weak and ineffectual, but realistically he wasn't going to achieve anything trying to fight Caesar. Caesar had too much backing, and once he went to the assembly, there was no way that Bibulus could defeat that. If he debated Caesar in the Senate, he would lose. And part of that is because Bibulus was once again relying upon omens and auspices. And Caesar was the Pontifex Maximus, so he was the leading authority on those things. He had the authority to say, no, you're wrong, I'm Pontifex Maximus, shut up. Because remember, Roman society is very hierarchical, and they very much respect rank. And this is especially true of the Optimate faction, even more so than other Romans. But all Romans in general are very deferential to rank, status, and things of that nature. And if we look at, say, the dialogues of Cicero where they debate things, the debates are basically just waiting until the person who has the highest rank tells everybody else to shut up and says what his opinion is. Uh, that's how the Romans work. They do, they're not like the Greeks where you can... Like some young whippersnapper can come up and challenge Socrates and call him an old fool. The Romans are very much obsessed with rank. And Caesar was the guy who had it. So Bibulus does stay home, however. And I think he's an augur. Or pretty much all these guys hold religious offices, by the way. At least one office per each one of these guys. So Bibulus stays home and says, I'm seeing all kinds of signs from the gods that what Caesar's doing is wrong and that we shouldn't be doing public business. This is impious, and uh, all this is illegitimate. And that's actually the basis by which they were going to prosecute Caesar ten years later. Or that they were planning to prosecute him, because obviously it doesn't happen. So, Bibulus as consul is not very effective. But he does earn a lot of respect from his colleagues in the Optimate faction. And this is largely because... The undisputed leader of the faction, Metellus Calair, died midway through 59. And since all the other leaders looked like crap, or were too junior, like Cato, Bibulus, who wasn't there and held the rank of consul, started to look pretty good. And because of that, Bibulus is actually one of the biggest leaders of the Optimates throughout the 50s. So he's actually, even though people compare him to Jeb Bush for fun... He's actually quite a bit more effective than Jeb. So, um, he now has a lot of authority in the faction. We don't know exactly what he does in most of the years leading up to the Civil War, but we do know some things that he does. 
we do see that he has high standing with his faction because after Karai, he was dispatched to try to clean up Syria. But this is only a couple years later. So in the meantime, the legate Gaius Cassius, the future assassin, has been patching things up and defending the frontier against Parthian counterattacks. And then Bibulus shows up, stays a few weeks, and leaves, and the Senate gives him full credit for cleaning things up. And they actually vote him 20 days of Thanksgiving. And part of the reason they do this is because Caesar has won some Thanksgivings due to his great victories in Gaul. So the Senate, at least the Optimates, are trying to offset Caesar's glory by giving glory to Bibulus. And in many ways, it is a huge middle finger to Caesar. Because what Bibulus did was nothing. <laughs> um, but the point is that they're trying to prop up Bibulus. And it shows that the faction was behind him. If anything... I don't know if there was an undisputed leader of the faction at the time, but certainly Bibulus was held in much higher esteem than Cato. Because sort of the popular tradition is that Cato led the Optimates, but there's zero chance that that's the case. Because there are plenty of guys who had held the consulship and whose advice was clearly followed more often than Cato's. So make of that what you will. Bibulus is one of those guys. I don't know if Bibulus was the leader of the Optimates, but he's actually in the running. And he's always one of their top two or three guys throughout the 50s. We get to 49. He's still governor in Syria, technically. And because of this, he is able to raise troops and money. So he meets Pompey in Greece, which no doubt is a boon for Pompey. Pompey rewards him with a fleet. So Bibulus is now the guy in command of the Adriatic fleet and his job is to try to stop Caesar and Antony from landing. And a lot of people who mock Bibulus point out that he failed to intercept both Caesar and Antony, which is technically true. We have to remember that interceptions in antiquity were extremely rare and difficult. Uh, it's not that Bibulus sucked, it's just that his task was not something that was likely going to happen. However, he actually did a pretty good job as admiral, and he made things difficult for Caesar. That's part of why Caesar is so low on supplies at Dyrrhachium, and why Antony hesitates so much before joining Caesar in Italy. Bibulus also destroys 30 of their empty transports on the way back to Italy, and this means that Antony needs to build more ships before he can go back and reinforce Caesar. So Bibulus as an admiral is actually pretty decent. Um... Oh, also another thing about Bibulus that's worth noting is that he's another one of those Romans who was very duty-bound. So when he was in the east in Syria, he sent his two sons to Egypt to try to recall some men who had been settled there, some Romans who had settled in Egypt uh, as men under Ptolemy. But the men didn't want to come back to Roman service, so they actually murdered Bibulus's two sons. So Bibulus is a man who had to overcome some grief and kept going. So in that, in that sense, he's actually as good of an embodiment of the Stoic tradition as, say, Cato. Uh, Bibulus did his duty despite personal setbacks. So um, overall, I think that Bibulus is a little underrated, and I think he gets a bad rap. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm actually thinking that Bibulus deserves a B. Maybe a C. I don't know. What do you guys think? B or a C for Bibulus? So in the chat, a B or a C for our boy Bibulus? Yeah, he's kind of on the border. I we'll go with the we'll go with the C. Probably yeah. He's I guess if if this was really if we had pluses and minuses, I'd probably go C plus or B minus. But I'll go with C for Bibulus with the possibility of upgrading later. Um. All right, so Bibulus, you are a C. Our first average Roman of the evening. Okay, so next up is the famous orator, Quintus Hortensius Hortulus, represented by 
a man from the Renaissance named something Hortensius. Like I said, I had to get creative here. And I believe this guy is either Dutch or German, if I'm not mistaken, this uh, person I used on for the image. He was sort of like one of those late Renaissance or Reformation figures I've never heard of before, so I can't really tell you much more about him. Anyway, uh, Quintus Hortensius was getting old by the time this period starts. He was actually consul back in 69, and he had been born back in 114, so he's about half a generation older than even the Triumvirs. During most of the 60s, he and Cicero were great rivals. They were seen as the best two forensic orders, and Cicero had actually uh, defeated him in a few cases and sort of become recognized as the king of the courts. But uh, for a long time, the rivalry was still pretty heated. By the time we reached this period, by about 60 or so, um, Hortensius and Cicero had become really good friends. So uh, the rivalry had largely ended, and it was more of a respectful thing now. And actually, as the decade progresses, they will get closer and closer and actually start to hang out and share their interests because both of them were men of culture. And um, Cicero, later on, after Hortensius is dead, will dedicate one or two of his works to Hortensius' memory. Uh, what's interesting about that is that Hortensius is the only one of the Optimates who actually fully embraces Cicero. The rest still look at him in a prejudiced way, but Hortensius is more open-minded in that regard to a new man. His style was influential at his time. Uh, he was much more stiff, formal, and verbose than Cicero. Cicero, of course, was known for uh, using both formal and informal speech and for using insults and all that. Hortensius is much more by the book and tries to be much more senatorial. Um, Hortensius, interestingly enough, he, while he is a member of the Optimates and he does speak in a way similar to Cicero in terms of defending people or prosecuting people, he doesn't do a whole lot in this period. But there is one incident that's worth mentioning. This is why he's on this list. In 56, when he was around, say, 58 or so years old, he decided he wanted to get married again. And he also decided that the person he wanted to be related to was Cato. He said, Cato, you're the man. I really love you. I think you're an excellent, an excellent young man. I want to be related to you so bad. And actually, I want to marry your 20-year-old daughter. And keep in mind, Cato's quite a bit younger than Hortensius. So he'd be, he'd be marrying his daughter to someone old enough to be your granddad. Just about. Cato instead says... That's a great honor, and it would be an excellent match. But really, uh, if we want to be related, I think the best way is for us to become Eskimo brothers. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to divorce my wife, Marsha. She'll marry you. And then that way we can say that we're related. And I don't think anybody else had ever had this idea, by the way. So in this one way, Cato, the arch traditionalist, innovated. So now he and Hortensius had a kinship because... Uh, they had shared a wife, I guess. Uh, now, it's interesting because Hortensius and Marcia have another daughter. Then, old man Hortensius croaks in 50. And what does Marcia do? Well, because she had a daughter with him, she gets the whole estate. And then she gets back together with Cato. So now, Cato's much wealthier. Because now he has Hortensius' whole estate. And maybe that's actually, uh, Hortensius might actually be okay with that. But a lot of people looked at it and they said, yeah, Cato, I thought you were a man of virtue. What the fuck's up with this? This seems really shady. I mean, are, are we sure that Hortensius died under natural circumstances? Uh, this, is all, this is all rather sus, man. But another thing that Hortensius did right before he died, or as he was dying, is he was the defense attorney for Appius Claudius Pulcher the former consul and the, bro the older brother of the famous Clodius. And despite his illness and his condition, Hortensius won the case, even though his opponent was Cicero's future son-in-law, an up-and-coming lion of the courts, a man named Dolabola. So, uh, Hortensius went out doing what he did best and went out with a big win. 
It's hard to assess him because, again, he's not a huge political figure in terms of holding office or doing something like that, but he was one of those guys who would speak early in the Senate and whose voice was well-known. And he's also one of the guys in the Optimate faction who definitely had some sway and he was never looked at as being the man. I rate him a C. I don't really see that he uh, was particularly effective or ineffective. He he was largely a one-note guy in, in terms of being an order, but he was a very good one. And by the way, I have a full biography of him, or a full life of him on my Romans of Renown series, just like I do for Bibulus. So if you're interested in learning more about those two guys, you know where to go. Next up, we have another heavy hitter from the late Republic, Hortensius's old rival, Marcus Tullius Cicero. Cicero is the greatest order of his era, and I would say one of the greatest political orders of all time. His significance for the teaching of Latin and the transmission of ancient philosophy, religion, and law is immense. And in fact, his cultural significance is vastly greater than his political significance. If it was just based on cultural significance, Cicero's an S and we can move on. But we're talking about politics. He's not an S and we can't move on. So, um, just to give you a sense of how important he is culturally, if you ever read about Roman religion or philosophy or law, even if you just get a book that focuses on it in an abstract, broad sense, you have to realize that all that the way that we perceive all three of those things is very heavily influenced by the way that Cicero thought about those things. And he actually wrote works describing how those things worked. Cicero's influence on those topics is inescapable. If you've ever studied Latin, whether in high school or college, you probably already know that the gold standard for style is Cicero. When we talk about norms in Latin, we're largely not so much talking about standards in the language as a whole, as we're talking about the standards that Cicero used when he wrote. So, uh, again, immensely important person, but politically, as we'll see, not quite as much. So, Cicero was known not only as a great orator, but as a great wit. And some of his wit made him enemies. So, for instance, he famously quipped about Caesar that he was every woman's man and every man's woman. Which was a clever way of saying, Caesar's probably fucked your wife. And also, back when he visited the king of Bithynia, there was a rumor that he slept with the man to get what he wanted. So, Cicero had this way of making quips about people that would stick. And of saying things about them that would really piss them off. And just like Caesar with the whole not understanding that clemency pissed people off thing, Cicero never seems to have figured out that his barbs against people made them hate him. So he kept doing it, even after he had gotten exiled effectively for doing that. Um, so it never clicked with him that you have to be careful about laying out insults against people. So Cicero's peak, he had two peaks in my opinion, 63 and 43. In 63, he was consul, and this is when he dealt with the Catalinarian conspiracy. Um, now, this occasioned all kinds of controversy and came back to bite him in the ass. But in one of his letters, he wrote about how that night men hoisted them on, him on his shoulders and escorted him home, calling him father of the fatherland and all that stuff after he defeated Catiline. Uh, but there were a lot of ramifications from that time. He killed Catiline without a formal trial. Or Catiline's conspirators, excuse me, not Catiline himself. And because of that, people said that he had violated Roman law and broken the Constitution by not recognizing the rights of Roman citizens. So this was used against him as a bludgeon for a long time. He did manage to fob off some attacks early on, but once Clodius came to prominence, he successfully prosecuted Cicero and sent him into exile. And part of the reason why Clodius was able to get him is that Cicero had alienated a lot of people who might have otherwise supported him. So as I mentioned, one of the people that Cicero was obsessed with was Pompey. 
And we can read about Cicero's feelings about Pompey in his letters to his friend Atticus. There's no other way to describe it. Cicero had a man crush on Pompey. He was so giddy when Pompey would talk to him or ask him to do something that he would write about it to his best friend and brag, Pompey knows my name. Pompey talked to me today. I had dinner with Pompey. It was amazing. Um, so Cicero was willing to do anything for Pompey, pretty much. But there were a couple exceptions. One is that he was actually invited to join the triumvirate early on. And had he done so, there's no way Clodius would have gone after him since Clodius also worked for the triumvirate. So he would have never gone into exile, and he would have had a lot more influence. However, by this point, Cicero is trying to become an optimate. And I say trying to become one. Because Cicero is a new man. And although the Optimates do allow people into their ranks who aren't who don't have pedigrees, including Titus Labinus, they want all of their leaders and all their consuls to be men who come from established families. They have no interest in new men. They want to maintain the old blood and use the new men as subordinates. So you'd be welcome to rise to the rank of Praetor, but if you go beyond that, they're not happy about it. And because Cicero had done just that, and because early in his career he had at least played the popularis from time to time, there was still distrust of him. And people were willing to utilize him because he was an effective speaker, but at the same time, they didn't want to be friends with him or associate with him personally. So he often found that he didn't get invited to parties, unless they were at the door and asked him to do something. Then he'd get invited. And eventually he kind of figures it out. But it takes them a really long time to figure it out, that they don't actually like him. And it's kind of sad in a way, um, because Cicero clearly had a certain amount of love for Pompey, and it was not reciprocated. And in fact, we know that Pompey and others found Cicero to be annoying. Cicero not only could say things that pissed people off, but he was very vain, and he'd brag about his achievements. Every time he'd meet somebody, he would ask them, Do you remember when I dealt with Catiline? God damn it, Cicero, yes, we remember. It was only ten years ago. But go ahead and tell us every detail again. We haven't, we haven't heard it this week. Um, so Cicero had that problem, and uh, anyway, he was exiled between 58 and 56 due to Clodius. He's eventually recalled due to the efforts of Clodius's enemies. And he will go after Clodius pretty hard. He also hates Clodius's sister because of her kinship to Clodius. So he delivers whole speeches where he talks about Clodia being a whore. Um, yeah, he, he's an interesting guy. Um, so uh, he is forced to serve as a governor in Cilicia because there's a bill that's passed by Pompey that says that everybody who serves as praetor or consul has to become a governor. This is during a shortage of governors. So Cicero has to go out to uh, Cilicia, which is basically southeastern Turkey or far north Syria, and it's a wild area where there are a lot of uh, tribes at this time and a lot of uh, rebellions in the hills. Cicero's pissed off that he has to go, but he takes his brother with him, and his brother does most of the work. Uh, later, the Civil War breaks out. Cicero seems to have been on the side of Cicer Caesar must be tried, which is odd because, in general, C Cicero, while he was pro-war, he was a complete physical coward in that sense. He had no interest in being on campaign. He hated leaving Rome. And he really had no interest in ever leading troops in the field. So a lot of Romans had delusions that they would be good. Cicero had no delusions. And I guess that is to his credit. So Cicero never has a karai. Because he never lets his... Um, he never gets delusional about what he's good at. So he's got that going for him. So... He, he's another guy who possibly could have made peace between Caesar and Pompey. I think that it is a mark against him that he doesn't step in and do more to prevent the outbreak of war, because he easily could have. He had enough standing with Caesar on a personal level to make that happen, even though politically they were at loggerheads. And part of the reason why they were close personally without being politically close, and maybe not close, but they certainly did have a relationship, Part of the reason is that uh, both of them had the same experience of losing an adult daughter. So uh, both of them lost an adult daughter, and both of them 
were much closer to their daughter than to almost anybody else. So both of them were personally devastated by that. And Caesar, I think, had that experience first, so he consoles Cicero. And apparently the two of them have a heartfelt moment, despite years of animosity, where Cicero, Caesar approaches him and says, Hey man, I know what you're going through. If you need to talk to anybody, you know, let me know. Uh, so Cicero, Cicero was actually touched by that. And um, it's also interesting, but, but the thing about Cicero that makes him inescapable is that because we have so many of his letters, we know way more about him than we know about anybody else on a personal level. So we know what he's thinking. We know how he feels. We know, for instance, that he hates his wife. We know a lot of things about that. We know about his brother's marital problems. Uh, we know a lot of things that uh, we don't know about anybody else. Um, so in 49, uh, so let's so 49, he joins Poppy in Greece, and basically he just bitches and moans all the time. Because again, Cicero does not like being out of Rome. He thinks that being a soldier is a miserable existence, yet he's pro-intervention and pro-war. So in today's world, he'd be what we call a chicken hawk. So he's basically urging Poppy to be a man and fight harder while he's just sitting back in the shade, like uh, reading a book and fucking around. He's not going to do anything, but he's still going to bitch at people about their lack of action. Uh, so we get to Pharsalus. And Cicero is one of the people urging Pompey to fight in the field. So, again, we're talking about someone with no military sense at all. And the bare minimum of experience that one could have and still be in the Roman Senate. And Pompey apparently heeds what he says. Him and Metellus Scipio. Uh, so, Cicero, of all people, is telling Pompey, if you don't fight, you're a bitch. Because Cicero knows so much about fighting. He's fought so many times. But anyway... So, uh, of course, the Battle of Pharsalus is waged. Caesar wins. At that point, Cicero surrenders and takes the pardon, not so much because he loves Caesar, just because he's homesick and he thinks being in the field sucks. He doesn't like living in a tent. He's not about that life. Cicero liked his luxuries. So he goes back to Rome. And he spends the next three or four years doing the vast majority of his uh, philosophical writings. So if you've ever read the Tusculan Disputations or On Duty or... Any of those other tracks that he wrote, those are all written between 48 and 44. And these are not original works, but still, basically what he does is he summarizes Greek philosophy and puts it in the Latin and also adds sort of a Roman cultural spin to it. So he writes his own Republic about how great the Roman system is, but all of the speakers use Roman deference rather than, say, the Socratic method. So... Um, that's his cultural contribution. It comes in this period. So without him basically being sidelined, that wouldn't happen. We get to the Ides of March, and Caesar's assassinated. Cicero comes out of the woodwork and begs to know, why don't you guys include me? I would have totally put a dagger in that bastard. I mean, I'm brave. You know me. I'm, I'm Cicero. I'll totally stab a motherfucker. And, uh, you know, of course they said, well, yeah, we would have totally invited you, but you're kind of old. Oh, okay, yeah. But in reality, of course, is that they know that Cicero is not the kind of guy that you include in a conspiracy. Because I don't know if he can keep his mouth shut, and also, he's not a fighter. So Cicero tries to put himself at the head of politics once again, and he hitches his wagon to, at first, the assassins, but they flee, and now he attaches himself to, Cicero, to Caesar's young heir, Octavian. And effectively, Cicero thinks, I can use this young man and get him to fight for the good of the Republic against his own will. So what he does is he tries to drive a wedge between Octavian and Antony, and he does this very effectively, by the way. So he delivers 14 speeches called Philippics, and a Philippic is named after the speeches that Demosthenes delivered about Philip, where it's just invective against King Philip. Uh, Demosthenes only had three Philippics, I think, maybe four. I guess not, there's either three Philippics and four Olympiads, or the reverse, I can never remember. But Cicero, when he makes Philippics, he writes 14 of them, and he delivers them all within an under a year. Whereas Demosthenes' speeches are spread out over about a decade plus. So you can see the kind of restraint that Cicero has. Anytime he thinks of a good insult, he's just going to fucking say it. So he's not the kind of guy who knows how to restrain himself. Now, surprisingly, Antony becomes really displeased with Caesar, uh, Cicero. So, when Antony 
makes peace with Octavian, and then they form up with Lepidus to form a triumvirate. Not shockingly, Antony demands the heads of Caesar, his brother, and his nephew. And he gets them. Um, Cicero was a little bit hard to evaluate as, in terms of his effectiveness because the problem that he has is that because he's completely non-military, he makes himself a non-viable player in the game. Without an army or without some sort of military reputation, he just isn't in the top tier of politicians. He can't be. So even someone like Bibulus is above him in that sense. And, and it's to, a, to a degree, a very, very limited degree, and a qualified degree, Metellus Scipio is above Cicero. Because again, at least he leads troops sometimes. Well, he's not able to lead troops, but he is willing. Uh, so there's that. Cicero built himself a box, much like Hortensius, where he can only go so high. And because of that, as a politician in this period, I'm actually going to rank Cicero as a D. Another thing to keep in mind is, as I mentioned, he tried to manipulate Octavian, but that's partly because he didn't understand how intelligent Octavian was. To be fair, no one did at the time. So Cicero's political calculations rarely work out, and also he gave some piss-poor advice to Pompey when it counted the most. Um, so I think, politically speaking, Cicero is massively overrated. Culturally, I think that he's rated about appropriately, if not even slightly underrated, uh, just because of the degree to which his thoughts about some of those topics are so unavoidable when discussing them that we can't help but take in some of his biases. Okay, so next up we will talk about Quintus Tullius Cicero, the brother of Marcus. Do a quick sound check. Still good. All right. So now we get to Quintus Tullius Cicero, most famous for writing a book on how to win elections. In theory, it was addressed to his brother Marcus, but that's kind of dumb because Marcus, of course, is a couple years older and did more, accomplished more politically. Quintus probably did this as a literary device. It was actually not unknown to address things to famous people in order to make sure that other people would read them. So, most likely, Marcus did not need Quintus' advice, but he gave it anyway. And the importance of this book is that it tells us more than any other source on sort of the nuts and bolts of how elections worked in the late Republic. So Quintus also has some um, importance as a cultural figure. He was educated alongside of his brother. He also was a big fan of Greek rhetoric and philosophy, but he was not as scholarly. Quintus Cicero did not write works about philosophy or anything like that, but because he's included as a character in some of his brother's dialogues, he certainly was interested in those topics. Uh, he, was just, he just had more of a passing interest. Well, not passing. He's probably pretty serious about it, but he's still not. He's not on the same level as all I'm trying to say. Uh, he was actually married to Atticus's sister, Pomponia. But that was a troubled marriage. Cicero, ironically enough, tried to intervene and tried to negotiate for them and tried to keep the peace. But Cicero himself was in a bad marriage, so he didn't really have much grounds to uh, work with. That... Uh, marriage ended in divorce in 45. In the meantime, Quintus actually had a pretty solid run during this period. In fact, I would say he had a better run than Marcus in many ways. He was praetor in 62, and then he went off to serve as governor of Asia from 61 to 59. And this meant that he was not in Rome when the first triumvirate formed. So, unlike Marcus, who had to make a decision before it was clear if the first triumvirate would succeed or not, Quintus could come back and claim, well, you know, I would totally have sided with you guys at the time. And because of this, he is able to get in the good graces of Caesar. Caesar also would have wanted to bring Quintus in to try to win over Cicero, who could speak for him and help him out. But Caesar, of course, was never able to win over Marcus Cicero, despite several efforts. Quintus, however, he was able to win over to a degree. 
So Quintus is much more willing to play ball with the triumvirate than Marcus. Although, of course, as we mentioned, Marcus was willing to speak for Pompey a lot, but not for anybody else. Quintus was willing to play ball with pretty much any of them. That being said, I don't think he's really a member of the triumvirate because he's looking to advance himself more so than to uh, sort of ride the coattails of someone like Caesar. And because they're differing views on how to utilize the triumvirate, there is some tension between the two brothers, by the way. And again, we know about this because of Cicero's letters. But they never have a full falling out or anything like that. There might have been a period where they didn't talk to each other for about a year, but uh, they never had a serious breach where it was uh, permanent or anything like that. So Quintus will now become a legate for Caesar, sort of in the middle, the second half of his conquest of Gaul. And he does fairly well overall. He, was a, he took part in the second invasion of Britain, and he also held his winter quarters during a revolt by Ambiorix. So Quintus, for the most part, fought pretty valiantly, and Caesar points out that Quintus both was able to inspire troops, which means he's probably a fairly skilled orator, and that he was a brave man. He never says that Quintus was a good general in the sort of X's and O's sense, or the whatever you want to call it, but uh, there's, there's also some evidence that Quintus was not the greatest general in terms of his uh, decision-making. He might have been a bit too emotional, but in terms of being a leader of men, if he's under Caesar's direction, good enough. And so Cicero, uh, Caesar actually seems to have liked him and praised him quite a bit in his commentaries, Although, again, he does want to make sure that Quintus remains an ally. So that's part of why Caesar portrays people the way that he does in his works. Again, Caesar started out as a politician and never ceased being one. Quintus definitely made some mistakes, but nothing that ended up being disastrous. Um, another thing about Quintus is that he was very fond of harsh discipline. So, if you had to choose a legate to serve under in Gaul, Quintus is not the guy. Because if you do something wrong, you're more likely to receive harsh punishment like being tied out at night or uh, being whipped or whatever it might be than you would be under pretty much anybody else. So, uh, Quintus then leaves Gaul to serve as the legate for his brother in Cilicia. His, uh, he, the, here, he will basically do all the military parts of the job whereas Cicero will do more of the administrative work. Although Cicero does technically go on campaign, but Quintus does all the actual fighting. And that suits both of them well, because Quintus is a fairly willing soldier, and Marcus is not. So, we don't really know much about what Quintus does after this point. He does sign up for the Senate's cause, just like his brother, but he's not utilized at all. Which is odd when we consider that Quintus was someone who had actual experience fighting alongside Caesar and might have some uh, insight into his mindset. But to be fair, Titus Labinus was also pretty underutilized at first. And he had been Caesar's number two for the entirety of the Gallic War. So, again, we have to remember the Optimates were extremely obsessed with rank. And because neither Labinus nor Quintus Cicero had ever been beyond Praetor, their opinions just weren't that important. And that's why I can also say confidently that Cato the Younger was not the leader of the faction. Because again, he was never consul. Okay. So Quintus was largely underutilized, and then he went home with his brother. So they're both in Rome. And they had some differences at this time, but they patched it up. Quintus might have read his brother's manuscripts at the time. Now, going into the Second Triumvirate, Quintus also sort of comes out of retirement, and he does enough to piss off Antony. We're not sure exactly what he does, but either that or Antony just wants to really hurt Marcus Cicero. So, uh, the three of them, Quintus, his son named Quintus, and then his brother Marcus, decide to go into exile, but Quintus and his son forgot to bring their money. So they return home to try to get money, and there the younger Quintus gets caught. The elder Quintus actually manages to hide himself. And he watches his son being tortured. And he assumes, if I come out bravely, then maybe these men will spare my son, let him go into exile, and they'll just kill me instead. So Quintus actually comes out and offers up his life in exchange for his son's safety. 
But all that happens is that he gets executed too. And of course, as we know, Marcus also got executed. And um, like Quintus, Marcus also died well, it's worth noting. So both of the Cicero brothers die valiantly. Uh, Quintus trying to save his son, and then Marcus by not resisting and saying, here's my throat, go ahead and slit it. Let's just get this shit over with. Um, the only surviving Cicero was Marcus's son, who was also named Marcus, but his son grew up to be a bit of an alcoholic, and I guess he was probably afraid to really have a political career because of how Octavian had let his dad die. So he sort of grew up to just be a party guy, and he was known for being a very pleasant, witty guy, so he was kind of like, kind of like his dad in terms of being witty, but without the malice. So Marcus Cicero the Younger was just sort of a guy you bring the parties who could tell stories and make people laugh, but he drank way too much and he died at the age of 29 or 30 without ever uh, reproducing. For me, Quinta Cicero is a C. I think he's about average for this period in terms of effectiveness. Um, he's more multi-talented than his brother, even if none of his talents run all that deep. Uh, but still, he, being multi-talented and having some military skills, I think, puts him a little bit above his brother. So, I guess that's just my uh, way of evaluating that. Alright. Now, let's move on to... Quintus Caecilius Metellus Calaire. So I mentioned him earlier in connection with 60 and 59. He is the last real leader of the Optimates. The last guy who was actually able to lead them to anything other than disaster. And he's also possibly one of the greatest obstructionists ever. Um, this guy could stop anything in its tracks. This was a man who could stop a government cold. So he's a cousin of the better known Metellus Pius, who of course himself was the son of Metellus Numidicus. So because of that, the Metellus name became very closely associated with the Optimate cause, and Metellus Claire had instant purchase due to that. His cousin Pius died in 63, which then increased Claire's stock considerably. Despite the fact that Metellus Calaire had been Pompey's brother-in-law and one of his legates in the East, a legate who did very well, by the way, Pompey divorced his sister when he came home from the East. And that made Metellus Calaire an opponent. So basically, he went from being a supporter of Pompey to being his worst enemy literally overnight due to marriage alliances. And that's why there are some scholars who think that marriage alliances are what made Roman politics, not ideology, not anything else. And I think there's something to be said about that, but I don't want to oversimplify. Uh, because again, there no single explanation that we might think of really encapsulates all what happened in Rome. Roman politics and the shifting of allegiances was a very complicated process, and the motives could vary pretty wildly. So, Metellus Calaire was the patrician consul in 60, and his colleague was another Pompeian guy, a guy we'll get to a little later, Lucius Afranius. So, going into it, Pompey might have been pretty confident of getting his stuff passed, because, again, two of his former legates are there, and they have a closeness to the soldiers. I mean, uh, Metellus Calaire handled the soldiers really well in the east, and won some battles on his own, and everything else. So he would want to reward those soldiers, you would think, but no. Metellus Calaire shuts down everything. Lucius Afranius can't pass a damn thing for Pompey's veterans, and the eastern settlement also gets shut down. Metellus Calaire now gets a bit of a big head, and he's almost certainly the guy who told C Caesar, okay, you can have a triumph or run for consul, but not both. I'm going to draw on a technicality that we never enforce to fuck you personally. So Metellus Calaire definitely preached obstructionism. And he was the one guy who seems to have been able to pull it off pretty consistently. Early in the first half of Bibulus' consulship, 
Metellus Calera was still the leader of the Optimates, rather than Bibulus. And he's the guy who leads the big walkout that forces Caesar to go to the People's Assembly. But he dies in the summer, or the midpoint of 59, and now the Optimates will never have another effective leader. It's worth noting, however, that had he lived longer, it's possible that his obstructionism might have been discredited, since, again, his obstructionism in 60 basically created the first triumvirate. Without that level of obstructionism, Pompey would have just passed his legislation, and, he, and when Cicero and I mean, Caesar and uh, Crassus approached him, he just said, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm the greatest man in Rome. I don't need you idiots. Especially you, Crassus. You've always been a dick. But instead, he says, okay, I see I need help. Let's form this alliance. So Metellus Calaire, you can actually make an argument for a low rating, but I won't. I'm actually going to go with a B for him. And the reason is because he did effectively accomplish what he set out to do. Now, there were some unintended consequences, but we have to keep in mind something. Up to this point, the Roman Senate had not ever really been punished for its obstructionism. So they obstructed the Gracchi. And they won. They, they lost temporarily, they had some unrest, but they ultimately prevailed. Then they claimed it as a precedent. So up to this point, the last 60 or so years of history had sort of suggested that obstructionism is the way to go, as long as you got an effective leader. And they had finally found one. And at this point, he's only in his 40s. He's not going to die anytime soon. He could have kept going. Uh, so, it's hard to say exactly what his career would have amounted to had he lived longer, whether he would have been discredited, or whether he would have done more to stop the triumvirate, or perhaps because he put more pressure on him, maybe he would have kept them going longer. But, uh, instead he dies, and we can only rate him on what he did do. Next up, we have another Metellus, Quintus Caecilius Metellus Criticus. He's older than Colaire, but less influential. He had been Hortensius' consular colleague back in 69. And basically his calling card as a politician is that he really fucking hates Pompey. So that's the organizing principle of his politics. Now, sure, he's an optimate, he's all that, but the reason that he is what he is is because he personally hates Pompey. The reason is, as a proconsul, he had been sent to Crete. Crete had sided with Mithridates during his uh, one of his final wars, the third or fourth one. And so the Romans wanted to punish Crete, so they dispatched this Metellus. He went there, and he was reducing the island. He was on the verge of victory. But then Pompey got the famous Gabinian Law passed, which gave him the pirate command with that Maius Imperium. So he starts issuing orders to Metellus, and Metellus does not think that he should be under Pompey's command. Because both of them have been loyal Sulla guys, and he feels that this younger man is taking his thunder. So he's super pissed. And he ignores Pompey's orders and finishes the job even when Pompey orders him to take his troops elsewhere. Because he knows by this point that Pompey has a reputation for stealing credit, as he did to Crassus. So Metellus wins the war, and ultimately his colleagues start calling him Creticus because of his conquest of Crete. However, Pompey, who could do his own obstructionism and held a grudge because his orders were disobeyed, managed to obstruct and prevent this guy from getting a triumph in 62. So Metellus Creticus never got his triumph, and what this also shows is that it wasn't only the Optimates who were able to obstruct. Anybody could use obstruction. It's just that was the preferred method of the Optimates. So, um, these two men hate each other, but mostly it's a one-way street because, again, Pompey is leagues above Metellus Calaire. Uh, he's not as effective as his relative Metellus Calaire, or yeah, Creticus, not Calaire, sorry. Creticus is not on Calaire's level, but he does have some standing in his faction because, again, they give him the cognomen of Creticus. He seems to have been much more temperamental and less measured than a, an effective faction leader should be. So even after his cousin dies, he's not able to assert himself as the new leader. And this is a man who will live until almost the end of the first triumvirate. So despite his seniority, despite being a Metellus, he's just not suitable as a leader. 
of a faction because he's he's sort of like in the Second Punic War, he's sort of like Torquatus, who was too polarizing. So he's a guy who could get applause from his own guys, but everybody else just hates him. But without a doubt, he was one of the new leaders in the sort of Colare-less faction that had no clear leader. And because he was around and so senior, that's yet another reason why Cato could not have been the leader of the faction, because you would not... If you're, if you're in a faction obsessed with rank, there's no fucking way that you take Cato over Metellus uh, Criticus. It's just unthinkable. So, there you go. We don't know exactly when he died, but it's probably around 53 or so, because it's at that time that we really see one of his other kinsmen by adoption rising to prominence, and that man, of course, is Metellus Scipio. For Criticus on my notes, I put him as an E, but because he's successful in Crete, I'm actually going to bump him up to a D. Alright, there we go. Let's do a quick uh, check of sound. Is everything still good? Everybody can still hear? Okay. So. Next up. We have. Well. Boys and girls, uh, let me clear my throat first, because we're about to enter into some epic territory here, and I, I want to make sure that I am uh, prepared here. Also at the midway point, pretty much. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, women and children of all ages, prepare to be amazed, prepare to be ignited, prepare to be excited, prepare to be delighted. Now we get to the main event of the evening, where we cover, by far, the most important and impactful man to live in this era. He is a man who is rock and reel and tap dancing from the ceiling, too cold to hold, too hot to handle, the real deal sex appeal. He is Quintus Caecilius Metellus Pius Scipio, or as he is most commonly known, Metellus Scipio. But I gotta ask you, are you ready for this? Because I'm about to hit you with some heavy-duty greatness. If you are a woman listening to this, you will need to have two extra pairs of panties on hand because this man's greatness is such that you will want to travel back to the past and make him put a baby in you. Are you all ready for this? Have you prepared yourselves? Okay, we can move forward. He was born as Publius Cornelius Scipio in around 195 or so BCE. And because of that alone, he was destined for greatness and for a guaranteed spot as consul, regardless of what he did politically. Um, there's, there's almost no way to be a Scipio and not achieve the consulship after Scipio Africanus. His great-grandfather was Scipio Nasica Serapio, the man who had murdered Tiberius Gracchus and who was himself a grandson of Scipio Africanus. So that makes him, what, a great-great-great-grandson of Scipio Africanus, something like that? And he took his patrician heritage extremely seriously. In fact, uh, it's safe to say that Metellus Scipio is exactly the kind of guy to talk about his pedigree every time he opens his mouth. Cicero talks a lot about his Catalinarian exploits. Metellus Scipio is like that with his birth. Did you know that I'm both Metellus and Scipio? Holy shit. That being said, I have tried to figure out exactly why this guy had the influence that he had. Why was he as successful as he was? What did he have going for him? Well, I have some ideas about that that we'll get into. And we'll also talk about why he is uh, the ultimate fail son in so many ways. So, um... His father dies young after he held the praetorship, which means that he's actually he actually has a parallel to Julius Caesar. Both of them are also patricians. That's about where it ends. Um, early on, he does demonstrate one important skill. And I think it's a skill that will 
put him, make him relevant, and I think make him the leader of the Optimates in the late days of the Republic. And it's this. He's very good at marriage negotiations. That's one thing he can do. So, think about this. Early on, he is a rival for the hand of the daughter of Lepidus. Lepidus, of course, being the father of the famous future triumvir. And, so this would be the sister of the future triumvir. So, Metellus, or Scipio at this time, he wasn't Metellus yet, was the leading candidate to win her hand, and he basically had it in the bag, but then he decided he didn't want to marry her. And again, his father's dead, so he can do what he wants. He's liberated. So he breaks off the engagement for a short time. In the meantime, Cato is also interested in the same girl. So he begins to court her and to try to win her father's approval. Or his father might have been dead by this point, but anyway, he's still trying to court this girl. And then, as soon as Cato is about to seal the deal and get his noble bride, Metellus Scipio comes back and he says, I changed my mind, we're getting married. And so Cato, all of Cato's hard work is pissed away. So Metellus Scipio is the kind of guy, for whatever reason, he can always get what he wants. And I don't know whether it's because he simply has a forceful personality, maybe he was big and could kick people's asses, maybe he was really good looking. I'm not sure what it is, but he did. He must have had something going for him that enabled him to get away with shit consistently, because he does this kind of bullshit a lot. So, because of this, even though Cato and Metellus Scipio will be political allies their entire lives, Cato personally despises the man, and thinks of Metellus as a complete piece of shit. So that, that's something I didn't know until recently when I was doing the research for this and gearing up for uh, my Romans of Renown on Metellus Scipio, is that Cato hates him. Uh, I don't know if, how Scipio felt about Cato, by the way, but I assume he probably just looked at him as trash because Metellus Scipio was an extremely arrogant motherfucker. Um... He got his start in the law courts as early as the year 80 when he defended Sextus Rosti Roscius. Excuse me. Um, he didn't really do much in that case because I think he was on the same side as Cicero. So Cicero was the main attorney and then Metellus, or Scipio was just kind of there. Later on, he gets his big break when Metellus Pius dies in 63 and has no heir. At that time, he decides he needs to adopt a noble son to carry on his name. So he adopts Scipio, who is related to him by some means or other. I mean, by this point, all the nobles in Rome are related to each other, patrician and plebeian. Uh, they're all cousin fuckers by this point. So he gets adopted, and this is how he becomes Metellus Scipio. So rather than joining the Metellus family, he basically merges the two families. And it's a really convoluted thing that he pulls off that no one else ever does. So most people had to choose. Do I go and do I go and become a plebeian so I can be tribune, or do I stay patrician so I can run for some religious offices? Apparently, it, it, there are scholars who argue that Metellus Scipio pulled enough strings that he got to be both, that he counted legally as both a plebeian and a patrician, and that's because it's possible he actually held the tribune office despite being born a patrician. So again, he gets away with shit that no one else could dream of getting away with. The deck is stacked in this man's favor. Things are just handed to him for no reason. Okay. So, somehow he does this. And if he did serve as tribune, it would have been in 59, which means that he would have been in a prime position to fuck around with Caesar as consul. He probably did so, but again, Caesar was able to overcome that kind of opposition the way that he did. So, uh, this guy's both a patrician and a plebeian, which is, you know, all, all manner of ridiculous. Um, he might have been praetor in 63, or it could have happened later. It's not entirely clear, and that's why when I said his birthday, it's somewhere between 100 and 95. It's not exactly clear when he did this, but it is clear that because of the first triumvirate rising to power, his rise up the cursus was delayed. So, despite merging the Metellii and the Scipii, or the Scipiones, I should say, he does not rise as fast as he should. 
And most likely, he is nearing 50 by the time that he achieves the consulship in 52. So, his real moment, as I said earlier, is that he served as Interrex along with Poppy after uh, the death of Clodius. And, well, actually, this is before the death of Clodius. This is when Milo is running for consul. So, there's a lot of street violence. There's an interregnum. And during this time, uh, Metellus, Scipio, and Poppy get to talking. Poppy's recently widowed, and Metellus says, you know what, uh, have you met my daughter? She's pretty hot. You should talk to her. So Pompey ends up marrying Metellus's daughter. And I say she's pretty hot. There's actually testimony that says exactly that. I'm not just making this up. And that's why I, I mentioned earlier that it's possible that Metellus Scipio gets away with some of this shit because he was good looking. Uh, we don't, I don't know what he looked like, but you know, if he has a hot daughter, there's a good chance that he was a good looking guy. So... Um, and, you know, when you're attractive, you can get away with more bullshit than if you're not. So, oh, by the way, his daughter, uh, I think I wrote her name down here. Where is it? Um, yeah. Her name is Cornelia Matella. And apparently, she, not only was she known for being very attractive, but she was also known as being very virtuous, kind. Uh, and also, I think she was either a poet or a musician or something like that. So, I mean, she was pretty sought after. Uh, she was a prize. And uh, Poppy, of course, as we know, likes younger women. So, you know what? He went after her. And again, we have to remember with Poppy, he started out as an optimate. So in many ways, he's coming home. He's not really defecting or betraying Caesar in the way that sometimes portrayed. So uh, while Metellus does pull off an absolute coup with this, it is worth noting that Poppy was a willing party. It's not as if Metellus Scipio pulled some Machiavellian brilliant scheme. And genetically speaking, having a hot daughter does not count as an achievement. It's sort of just random chance in a lot of ways. But I, I do think it is worth either arranging this marriage and approving it, or having the hot daughter has to be Mattel Scipio's leading achievement. So he is now peaked. So because he is the guy who won over Poppy, he's basically the leader of the faction. Poppy, I think, at this point, is a little bit too prominent to be a faction leader. I mean, Poppy is one of the legends of Roman history already. The man is a living legend. So, to call him a faction leader, I think, is kind of demeaning. Mattel Scipio, though, very much does lead the faction, and he is the link to Poppy. He's the guy with the most access because he's Poppy's father-in-law. And apparently the two of them do become pretty close. They like each other. So, um... This means that Poppy will now be, have his effectiveness greatly reduced because he's taking horrible advice on a regular basis from a man who's a complete dipshit. Uh, the joke I thought about leading this off with, but I'll reserve for now, or I'll, I'll go through now, is that because Metellus Scipio became leader, the entire Optimate faction developed MS. And that, of course, is a multiple sclerosis joke for those of you keeping track at home. Uh, in many ways, Metellus Scipio was, you know, MS, his initials, he was a form of MS for his faction because he really fucked them over through his stupidity. So what stupidity am I referring to, you might wonder? Well, we will go through his three deeds of doom, or I guess you could call it his trifecta of dumb fuckery, because there are three instances where he shows himself to be one of the dumbest men in Roman history. And in fact, I'll stand by this. He is the dumbest Roman to ever find himself in a position of power and not be an emperor. So, yeah, sure, there are other emperor there are emperors in the future who might be dumber than Metellus Scipio, but not fucking many. So, here is how things shook out. Of course, famously during the standoff between Caesar and the Senate, Metellus Scipio is among the loudest voice demanding that there be no peace and that Caesar come home, face trial, and get convicted and executed. So Mattel Scipio was too stupid to say it will be a fair trial in order to try to increase the chances of getting what he wants. He's basically saying openly, yeah, we're going to convict the motherfucker, and he's going to get executed. It's going to be great. So, again, brilliant. So he got his way, and the Civil War turned out. It was unnecessary, and they started out losing. So they lost Italy, they lost Spain, and then Pompey rescues things through his generalship. So Pompey has turned things around, and it looks like he will prevail. Then we're at Pharsalus. Caesar's trapped, 
and Metella Scipio is the loudest of the voices saying, Pompey, I demand that you uphold Roman honor and fight this man in the field. You're pissing me off. You're letting me down, son. Stop being a bitch and go fight Caesar. And uh, Pompey relented and did it and lost. Metella Scipio, of course, escaped. He made it to Africa. And now Caesar's coming. So, there were plenty of capable men in Africa. We'll talk about the man who had defended it from Caesar's legates early on. There's also Titus Labinus. There's Cato the Younger. There are all kinds of people who have military skills or seem to. When Metellus Scipio arrives, he says, I'm the senior man. This is my army. I will defeat Caesar. But why, Metellus Scipio? What, what's the reason why you should take command? Simple. My ancestor, Metellus Numidicus, was a really good general in Africa, and my other ancestor, Scipio Africanus, was pretty much the best general of all time in Africa. I can't lose here. The gods will deliver this victory. There's no way in hell Caesar can beat a man who is both Metellus and Scipio at the same time. That's more than he can handle. So you guys need to step out of the way and defer to my pedigree and my rank, because it is my right as the only consular here, and the senior of those consulars, to take command. So hand it over. And uh, another mark against Cato, by the way, is that Cato agreed, and said, yes, it is Metellus's right to take command, despite the fact that he's a fucking moron. So Metellus Scipio is now in command of the best army the Senate ever had. Thapsus should have been a Senate victory, or at least they probably had like a 60-40 chance of winning, just looking at the troops there. They had fine legions. They had elephants. They had Numidian cavalry. They had all kinds of things on their side. And um, they actually won a number of the early skirmishes, too. So they were in a good position. And uh, early on, Labinus and others have been active, and they've been kicking ass. So Caesar knows that Metellus is a fucking moron, so he basically lets him win a few skirmishes more and build up his confidence. So Metellus is thinking, fuck yes, the gods are on my side. I knew it. I'm Metellus and Scipio. I can't possibly lose. I'm the man. So they fight at Thapsus, and Caesar wins. And it's a crushing victory. It's not even close. It should have been close. A good general could have made it close or a victory. Metellus Scipio, of course, is woefully incompetent, but he does die like a man. I forget exactly the circumstances of how he died in the battle, but it was fairly impressive, uh, actually. Uh, let's see. I'm going to look that up real fast just to... Make sure we go over that. Because I do want to say at least one charitable thing about the man other than him having a hot daughter. I feel like, you know, that's pretty low praise. I mean, uh, I mean, there, there's some pretty despicable scumfuck politicians who have attractive children. So, you know, it's not a, not a big accomplishment or an attractive spouse or whatever it might be. So, um, when he got wounded, it was a mortal wound, but he told his men, according to the Stoic philosopher Seneca... Imperator se bene hobbit. Your general's just fine. So basically, kind of the old cliche of, I'm alright, and then you keel over and die. And by the way, uh, the coin that we have here, representing the Telescipio, is one that he minted during a short time in Africa. And of course, basically he's predicting that he's going to be the next Africanus. I think on one side of it, I can't tell from this small image if this is an elephant or not. No, this is just a helmet, sorry. I think on the other side is that an elephant to represent what was going to be the greatest victory ever. That never happened. Um, let's see. How should we rate Metellus Scipio? God damn, this is hard. Oh man, I don't know. This is such a soul-searching issue. I mean, how how do we rate someone who accomplished so much? Let's just put his head in the box. How about that? That works for me. Does it work for you guys? Put his head in the box. Guy's a fucking idiot. All right. Okay, so um, I guess sound must still be working. Cool. Now let's move past. I know it's gonna be hard, guys, but we're actually gonna have to move past Mattel Scipio, which means moving past the greatest of the greats. Uh, you know, the the goat. So we'll have to. We'll have to move on. I'm sorry. I apologize. But it's all downhill from here. We will not encounter anyone else 
as amazing as Metallo Scipio. All right, next up we have Julius Caesar's older cousin, Lucius Julius Caesar. Lucius Julius Caesar is about five years older than, Joy than Gaius Julius. He was consul in 64 and then served as censor in 61, I believe, or 60. And he's also the uncle of Mark Antony. So his sister is Antony's mother. Lucius almost certainly was a lifelong popularis, but even despite his status as such, um, and despite his strong support for Gaius throughout the 50s and beyond, Lucius was never the man. And I don't know why that is. But despite his obvious prominence and importance in his own regard, he never was anywhere close to being the leader of the faction. I think that might just be because Gaius had Marius as an uncle. But Lucius Julius Caesar is important in his own right. And I made a whole video on him, by the way, if you're interested in learning more. So, um, he will actually probably be the most important senior supporter of Caesar during the First Triumvirate. So, if there is a senior senator in Rome who is known to be Caesar's mouthpiece, it is Lucius Caesar. When he won in 64 for his consulship, he beat out the other patrician candidate, Catiline. So in a way, you can actually blame Lucius Caesar for Catiline growing as desperate as he did and watching the conspiracy. So that's a fun trivia fact. Um, let's see. Lucius also teamed up with Gaius to try to prosecute Gaius Rabirius in the year 63 for crimes he'd committed against Saturninus all the way back in 100. This failed. The object was to restore the tribunate, but... When they knew the Caesars were going to win the trial, uh, the Optimates resorted to obstruction using religion and pulled it off. They basically said, oh no, I'm seeing omens, we have to cancel the court, we have to call off court today, some birds are in the sky, uh, the gods are mad, so uh, the trial basically miscarried and the tribunate was not really restored at that time, at least not to its full power. Um, during the Catalinarian conspiracy, by the way, while Julius Caesar was put on the hot seat by Cato and the Senate threatened violence against him at one point, Lucius never faced violence or danger because he voted to execute the Catalinarians immediately and never offered any quarter, unlike his cousin. So that's the one instance where Lucius and Gaius were not on the same side. Otherwise, Lucius and Gaius were pretty much peas in a pod. In 61, Lucius became censor. And that was his high watermark, and also the last time where he was not just his cousin's assistant. So this is the last time he was the senior Caesar. It was the last time he could go to Rome and ask for Caesar, and you'd have a better chance of ending up at Lucius's doorstep than Gaius Julius's doorstep. So over the next decade, we don't hear that much about him. But we know that he was in Rome and that he was important for uh, the triumvirate. In 52, he actually went to Gaul to become a legate. And because of his age, most likely, uh, Caesar didn't want to put him in harm's way. So he left him in Transalpine Gaul during Vercingetorix's revolt. So his goal was just to hold on to Rome's long-standing territory with about 10,000 men and keep the supply lines open. Lucius does that, no big deal. In 49, he accompanied Caesar across the Rubicon and then would spend the civil war years in Rome trying to hold down the fort. Uh, Caesar actually turns more to Lucius's nephew Antony for support than anyone else during this time. And I assume, again, that's because Lucius was old. Um, and, of course, Lucius was probably the reason why Caesar and Antony had a relationship to begin with. So... Um, when Caesar put Antony in charge and went after Pompey, and then Antony came with reinforcements, Lucius was left in charge, and apparently he did a really bad job of trying to keep order in Rome. So Rome was a pretty rough place while Lucius Caesar was in charge. He was not a very effective, uh, I guess, what would it be, city praetor or urban praetor would be the equivalent of what he was doing at the time.
I don't know if he actually held that office formally or not, but that was effectively what he was doing. So later on, he tried to retire after the Ides of March and may have been disappointed that Caesar didn't name him in his will. Uh, most likely it's because Caesar knew that Lucius was not up to snuff and was also too old. So Lucius tried to retire, but then uh, the Second Civil War started after the assassins fled east and then Octavian and Antony got into it with the Senate. So Lucius comes out of retirement and at first he tries to negotiate between Antony and the Senate, but then, for whatever reason, he completely turns on his nephew and starts denouncing Antony. So he starts backing Cicero. And Antony, of course, is pretty furious about this, because up to, that, up to this point, he and his uncle have been pretty tight. But now, they're at odds. And so, when Antony formed the Second Triumvirate, one of the other men he named was his uncle, Lucius Caesar. However, Lucius Caesar was smart enough to know that if he went to Antony's mom, his sister, he might have a chance, so that's exactly what he does. He flees to his sister's house, and she prevails upon her son to let it go. Lucius actually goes back to Rome and remains a senator. And we know as late as the year 40, he is still in Rome and working as an augur, because we have an inscription that talks about him doing the augury, or taking the augur, uh, whatever the phrase would be. What is it take? Performing augury. How about that? So, uh, Lucius sort of died in obscurity quietly after trying and failing to betray his nephew, which is kind of pathetic. Um, that being said, when we rank him, uh, I have here a D or an E, so I'm just going to defer this to you guys. Do you think Lucius Caesar is a D or an E? Because the man's not super effective. Yes, Michael Parenti's book is really good. The Assassination of Julius Caesar. So Restitutor Orbis says D. Anybody else? A D or an E for old Lucius. F, huh? Damn. I think F's a little harsh. Um, I'll go with, I'll go with D, I mean, D I think is fair, I mean, he's sort of on the border though, he's one of those guys, if, if this, if this had more options or if I had made this more complicated, I'd probably go with D minus, but yeah, he, I think he's a D. There are people who did a lot more damage than he did. I don't think he's as bad as Crassus who lost Karai. So, also, by the way, when I had a specific image to use for these guys, I tried to use something that was supposed to represent them. This symbol, the SPQR, that means that they're mostly aligned with the Senate. If I used this image of the guy with the sword, the soldier leading the charge, those are the Pompeians. So people most align with Pompey. If it's Caesar on horseback crossing the Rubicon, it's a Caesarian. So just to explain my system here, I forgot to say that earlier. Okay. So, next up is Lucius Afranius. So, he is a near contemporary and lifelong supporter of Pompey. He was born around 110 and Picenum near Pompey, and his family was a client family of Pompey's family. So, he got his start serving alongside of Pompey in Pompeius Strabo's army, that would be the father of Pompey, during the Social War. Then when Pompey raised his armies to fight for Sulla, Afranius was basically his right-hand man and would remain so for the next 20 years. So, just like any great general, Pompey always had assistants, and two of his leading assistants were Afranius and Petrius, two men we'll talk about. But Afranius was definitely the more important of the two. So, when Pompey fought against Sertorius, for instance, one of his wings was always led by Afranius, and at one point in one of the battles, the Battle of Sucro, Afranius managed to rout the wing opposed to him and tried to storm Sertorius' camp, but ultimately just exposed himself and led to a defeat. But other than that, as a subordinate, Afranius was very effective, 
During the Eastern Campaign, he led independent forces. He did well against Mithridates and Tigranes and all the rest. So as a subordinate general in the 70s and the 60s, Afranius was really solid. But that's not what we're rating here. So in 60, he was elected consul. And this was on the strength of Pompey's support. Pompey went before the people and said, this is my best friend. Elect him consul if you want to do me a solid to pay me back for making Rome great again. Or greater than ever, I guess, really. So, Afranius got elected. And his job was to confirm Pompey's settlement in the east. At first, they might not have anticipated that Metellus Calaire would turn on them so hard just because of a divorce. Because marriages in Rome were not about love, and so rarely did divorces result in grudges. But in this case, apparently it did. So Metellus Calaire now asserts himself as the leader of the Optimates and shuts down everything, as we talked about earlier. I can't entirely blame Afranius for this failure, but it was a failure and it was on his watch. He did not manage to figure out how to get around Metellus Calaire's obstructionism, and he basically sat back helplessly while Pompey's men waited in Rome unpaid and going broke and becoming restless. And while the settlements that they had made in Syria and Palestine and elsewhere were not being confirmed and were at risk of being lost to revolt or something else. So the stakes were high. And that's part of why Pompey turned to Caesar and Crassus to form the triumvirate, because things were getting bad. And clearly, Afranius was not able to figure things out. So, because of his relationship with Pompey, he remains one of the senior players in the triumvirate, and now he's an ex-consul as well, so he is one of the first senators to get to speak, and I have no doubt that he was important. But that being said, overall, he does not seem to have had say, as much influence as most of the big names. Of all the ex-consuls at the time, he might have been one of the more easily overlooked, and that's partly because, as consul, he hadn't really done that much. He had been a failure. So, he is not very good at that. Now, in 55, he will be appointed to be the legate for Pompey in Spain. There will be other legates with him, including a man named Terentius Varro, and also Petrius. Afranius will be in nearer Spain with three legions, and that will make him Caesar's nearest neighbor with an army. So, effectively, his job is to make sure that Caesar has a counterweight to his power in Gaul. And also, he was funneling troops to Caesar when relations were better between Pompey and Caesar. So, Afranius does a pretty decent job at this time, and he also does some training of his men. He knows that they will need to face the Celtiberians, so he actually trains them in Celtiberian tactics. And this does come in handy later against Caesar. So, he trains them to fight in loose order, and to fight better on broken ground. Again, keep in mind, Afranius has a pretty high reputation as a subordinate. So, in Caesar's commentaries on the civil wars, he starts out by saying that he chose, or he doesn't start out, but he, uh, after he conquers Italy, he says, I had a choice to make. I would either go to Greece and fight a general without an army, or go to Spain and fight an army without a general. So, I went to Spain. I think that's a pretty unkind slight to Afranius and his generalship. But in the event, it was not entirely unfair. Now, a big part of generalship is training your men properly, especially in ancient warfare where discipline is extremely important. So Afranius did succeed at that. But in many ways, he's kind of the McClellan of the Great Civil War in the sense that he does a good job organizing, his strategy is okay, but tactically he does not know how to find an opportunity or exploit it. So... Afranius has three legions, he orders Petrius to bring up two more, and he faces off against Caesar's legate Gaius Fabius at the river Segra. Here he wins the battle, and he cuts off a piece of the army under a future consul who will cover in the second triumvirate period, Lucius Monatius Plancus. However, he does not close hard enough to crush this unit. So Plancus gets away and lives many, many more years. So he took, he took what could have been a great victory and turned it into a, a mediocre one. Now Caesar comes up with the rest of his forces. Uh, Petrius' two legions come up. And now we're ready for a major battle. 
and this will take place at Ilerda. So what happens is that the fighting here will be inconclusive, with Afranius actually gaining the advantage because of his light troops, or because of his train in loose order. So when the two forces are skirmishing and trying to forage, Afranius' men have the edge. So Caesar is a little put off by this, but of course he Caesar's doesn't panic. And then the river floods unexpectedly, and this fucks Caesar much more than Afranius. So Caesar's men effectively are soaking wet, they're a bit trapped by the river, and they're without supply. So Caesar has to figure out how to bridge this river that now surrounds him on pretty much all sides to get at both at Afranius and at supplies. Afranius, during this time, basically just tries to wait out Caesar and doesn't really counteract Caesar's efforts to get across the water. So Caesar gets his cavalry across and then sends them to Afranius' rear to make sure Afranius has similar problems. Then his infantry get across, and now he turns the tables, and Afranius is besieged at Alerta. So Afranius, once again, had the thing won, and then just blew it. So in many ways, Afranius is a lot like Pompey, in the sense that he knew how to set himself up for a victory, but not how to complete it. At least Pompey as an old man in this period, not Pompey as prime. So now Afranius is in a terrible spot, his men are going hungry, and they also have no fresh water. So Afranius is forced to surrender on August 2nd. Five whole legions surrender. So Caesar now has five new legions. Of course, they can't be relied upon to fight Pompey, but they can hold Spain, and he can use his other forces elsewhere. So this is a huge victory for Caesar, one of his greatest, and for Afranius, this is a failure of epic proportions. Make no doubt about it. So, Afranius now becomes one of the very first senators to receive Caesar's pardon because of this. But rather than going back to Rome, he reneges immediately and joins Pompey in Greece. He does not receive any commands once he gets there despite being Pompey's best friend. Probably because he failed. But also we have to remember uh, the Senate is obsessed with rank, especially the faction that now has no uh, moderates or cesareans in it. And because Afranius was not as senior as the other guys and was not as distinguished, and because he had failed recently, he doesn't get a job. But despite his failures, he's still a much better soldier than many of the men in Pompey's camp, including Metellus Scipio. So Afranius gets no job here. He does nothing in Greece. He flees to Africa. And... Early on in the skirmishes, he's there, and he also helps to organize the army, so he's one of the other people here. But he doesn't try to claim the command, possibly because his confidence was shattered by uh, what had happened in Spain. So anyway, because actually, technically, I think he had seniority over Scipio because he had been consul earlier. Anyway, Afranius is in some of those early skirmishes, and Caesar spots him, and he points to his men, and he says, That man is an oath-breaker. If you capture him, kill him immediately. So, Afranius knew that there was no escaping Caesar. So he teams up with, uh, so after the Battle of Thapsus, where they lose, he and Sulla's surviving son, Faustus, try to flee to Spain, but they're captured by one of Caesar's detachments under a mercenary, and the mercenary commander wanted to hand them over to Caesar for execution, or perhaps Caesar would have tried to give them a pardon again to show just how merciful he was. But instead, there was a mutiny in the camp, and Afranius was murdered. So, Afranius, initially I put him as a D, but thinking about it now, I think he has to be at least an E. Oh man, he might even be, he might even need his head in the box. Oh, this is tough, because he's not without, he's not without his merits, right? I mean, this guy did his due diligence, he trained his men. And before this point, he showed that he, he is good as a subordinate general. He was brave. He helped to organize that army in Africa. But losing five legions the way that he did, blowing two opportunities, I mean, partly it's that the man was too old by this point. Uh, he was past his prime, so he didn't have the killer instinct anymore. So actually, I'm, I'm going to do something I don't think I've ever done. I'm going to go from against the D that I put in my own notes. I'm, I'm actually going to put his head in the box. 
Uh, Gabinius just shit the bed in a way that did massive damage to the uh, Optimate cause. He's not as bad as Metellus Scipio, don't get me wrong, but uh, man, he fucked up. Five legions, that's a huge defeat. And by the way, interestingly enough, we'll see that someone else on the Caesarian side fucked up bad enough that they actually sent those legions back to Pompey's side, or at least the side of his son. So, uh, we'll look forward to that. Next up we have another famous supporter of Pompey, or at least a man who made his name as a Pompey guy, but might not have been a hardcore Pompey guy. And that is Aulus Gabinius, who was famously Tribune in 67, the guy who passed the Gabinian Law, which gave Pompey his Maius Imperium. So if you were to look up Aulus Gabinius, the first thing you would find is that he was Tribune, but actually he went far beyond that, and his significance is much greater than that. Although that is the most important thing he was ever responsible for, to be sure. So, um, after he did that for Pompey, Pompey took him on and made sure that he promoted Gabinius and made sure that he got offices. Gabinius went with Pompey in the Third Mithridatic War and led two legions on his own and threatened the Parthians with them. So Pompey must have trusted him pretty well since he basically put him on a level with Metellus Colaire and even Afranius. So Gabinius became a pretty trusted lieutenant. He served as Praetor in 61 and earned a lot of popularity that year by putting on elaborate games. Normally, the people who put on games were the Aediles, but there wasn't anything to prevent you from putting on games as another magistrate. So Gabinius made himself more popular. And then, being a Pompey guy, he was able to get elected as consul in 58 alongside of Caesar's father-in-law. So the two of them made sure that the first triumvirate was even stronger than it had been in 59. And basically, at this point, Caesar's command in Gaul was safe, and he could be assured of funding and extra troops and anything he wanted. At the same time, while in office, Gabinius worked with Clodius to send Cicero into exile. In 57, he went to Syria to become the proconsular governor, and he was active and successful here. Uh, he intervened in Judea to, depo to reinstate a deposed high priest, and then Pompey sent him a message and on Pompey's urging, but without seeking the Senate's permission, Gabinius entered Egypt in 55 to restore Ptolemy the Twelfth. He left behind a cavalry force who took his name and settled there. Those are the same men who later murdered the sons of Bibulus. So he had a pretty successful career up to this point. He came home. Uh, While well, he came back to Syria, he fought some brigands, defeated them, and he also had to go back to Judea to defeat Alexander, son of Aristobulus, defeating 10,000 men in battle, which technically qualified him for a triumph. And by the way, the Roman governors in Syria did have permission to go to Judea and mess around, because Judea was a part of the Roman world, whereas Egypt was not. So predictably, he would get prosecuted for going to Egypt but that's not what brought him down. And by the way, because he defeated 10,000 men in battle, he was eligible for a triumph, but he doesn't get one. So he goes home, and now he has to face three different high-stakes trials for capital punishment. He's got a good chance of beating all of them, actually. And, of course, his successor in Syria is Crassus. We know how that goes. So Gabinius goes back to Rome, he beats the first trial, which was, um, a, I think, about his Egypt campaign. He somehow won that one, even though he clearly violated the law. The second one was kind of bullshit, but he got convicted on it. And this was the charge that he had screwed over the Publicani, the public tax collectors. Now, basically, he did fight corruption as governor. And that's why he got convicted of corruption, because the men who went after him were looking to get their pockets lined, and Gabinius limited their ability to do so. So Gabinius uh, had to go into exile. So, um, actually, wait, no, the charge that he got hit with was extortion, and the reason is because Ptolemy the Twelfth bribed him for 10,000 talents. 
So Gabinius had to go into exile. And by the way, if you seek exile to avoid the death penalty, not only do you get to keep your head, but you also get to keep all the money you stole. So Gabinius was an extremely wealthy exile, just like Varys before him and others. So Gabinius went into exile. When in 49, the Civil War broke out, and rather than rallying to his old supporter, or his old guy, Pompey, he instead goes with Caesar. I don't know why. It's not really stated why he went with Caesar, but apparently he still did hold Pompey in high regard because he said, although I'm siding with Caesar, I refuse to fight against Pompey directly. I might, I'll fight against any of his subordinates. I'm not fighting Pompey, though. So that was his condition. And so he uh, was mostly used to move troops around. So Gabinius was moving a column of men through Illyria to reinforce Caesar's army in Greece after the Battle of Pharsalus. And here he was attacked by some hostile tribes in Illyria. I think the Dardanians. He won, or at least he escaped with his men. And then he also had to face a rogue Pompeian general. He defeated him, or at least held his own. But then, after all that exertion, he fell ill and died in either late 48 or early 47. So Gabinius is a bit harder to rate. But um, if we were rating him on importance because of the Gabinian law, he'd be quite high. For rating him as a magistrate during this period, I'm thinking he's pretty average. He's about a C. This is from a time where he minted a coin, by the way. So Gabinius, at one point, was in charge of a mint. Next up, we have another man who followed Pompey, Marcus Petrius. He was a client of Pompey, also from Picenum, also born around 110. His chief claim to fame, other than being one of Pompey's uh, legates in a number of campaigns, is that he had been back in Rome serving as praetor when the Catalinarian conspiracy had happened. So he was the second in command of the consul Antonius Hybrida's army that was pursuing Catiline in Etruria. And here, Petrius... Uh, took command after Hybrida claimed that he was having a gout attack, and Petrius defeated Catiline in an open battle at Pistoria. This wasn't much of a victory because Catiline's men were pretty ragtag, but still, somebody had to do it, and Petrius was that guy. So, if you read about, if you read, say, Sallust's account of the Catalanian conspiracy, you will recognize Marcus Petrius there. In 49, or in 55, of course, just like Afranius, he was sent to Spain. He was given two legions a little bit deeper in Spain. He brought those two legions to join Afranius, and then they fought at Alerta. The defeat at Alerta had very little to do with him, because, again, Afranius was the chief commander. We do know, however, that, um, a, that Petrius was a harsh disciplinarian. So the men started fraternizing during that period of inactivity. And while Caesar would just round up the Pompeians and send them back. Petrius, when he found Caesarians wandering in his camp trying to trade or whatever, he would put them to death. So Petrius was a pretty harsh guy. So, of course, they lose at Alerta. He also gets pardoned, goes to Greece, and then to Africa. In North Africa, he does quite a bit alongside of Cato to help organize a new army. And as a disciplinarian, he's a pretty effective drill master. So, he stays around for the battle at Thapsus under Metellus Scipio, and then he attempts to flee. So, after that defeat, he formed up with Juba the Numidian prince who had joined Pompey's forces, and they made a suicide pact, and they basically drew straws or flipped a coin to see who went first. The idea was, one of us will kill the other and then kill himself. So, Petrius drew the short straw, so he, got, he had to kill Juba, and then have a slave help him die. So the slave held a sword, and Petrius ran into it. And that is how he met his end. He did not want to live in a world where Caesar was in charge. And just like Afranius, he was an oath-breaker because he had taken Caesar's clemency on the grounds that he would not oppose him anymore. Um, I will be more generous to Petrius than I was to Afranius. To me, Petrius is a D. He didn't really achieve anything, but at the same time, he didn't actively make anything worse. And in fact, he did help the cause a little bit by training men. 
but he was not able to use his military experience to any real end uh, in battle itself, so I can't really even put him in a C. And of course, as we mentioned, because the Optimates were so obsessed with rank, even if Petrius had had the most brilliant advice in the world, nobody would have given a shit. So, there's that. And now we move on to a famous member of the Caesarian faction, someone whose fame was massively overshadowed by both his brother and his sister, but who nonetheless was important at that time. I am speaking of the consul of the year um, 54, Appius Claudius Pulcher. His younger brother, Publius Clodius Pulcher, famously, uh, we'll talk about him later, but he has become the most famous member of the family to the extent that people forget that he had an older brother who kept on the family name. If you read Livy's book one, you will, or maybe book one, book two, more book two, you'll learn that the name Appius Claudius Pulcher is one of the most common in all of Roman history, pretty much generation after generation. There's always an Appius Claudius Pulcher. So, he was a Caesarian, just like his siblings. Culturally, he actually has some significance, believe it or not. He is the recipient of 13 surviving Cicero letters from the late 50s. And he was a man known for his learning. So just like Cicero and Hortensius, he was known for being interested in Greek philosophy and oratory, and he exchanged correspondence with these other men of learning when they weren't in Rome. However, he's also known as being extremely arrogant and prickly. So, there's one letter between Cicero and Caelius, where they talk about, basically, yeah, we respect this man's intellect, but God, he's a dick. And, if you think about it, if you think about the kind of aristocratic arrogance that almost all these people had, if they're singling out Appius Claudius Pulcher for being a dick, he must have been a huge dick. Because, all these guys were like that. It's just, he took it to another level, apparently. So, um, at Luca in 56, when the Triumvirs reaffirmed their arrangement after some tension between them, Appius Claudius Pulcher attended the meeting and set up an arrangement with Pompey. So he basically joined the first triumvirate at that time and arranged for his daughter to marry Pompey's oldest son, Gnaeus. And that meant that Pompey was forced to back him for consul the next year, so he got elected to be the consul in 54. And by next year, I mean he ran in 55, because you run the year before you serve. His colleague was Cato's brother-in-law, Domitius Ahenobarbus, another diehard conservative. So once again, there's yet another person who was more senior than Cato. Later on, he went to serve as proconsular governor in the late 50s, and so he was not in Rome at the time when his little brother was murdered. He did have to face a trial at one point at the hands of someone, and Hortensius saved him from that. In 50, despite just surviving a very close call and the trial that Hortensius won, he was then elected censor. So he was serving a censor in 49 when the war broke out, and this meant that he had enough seniority that he's yet another person who could have done more to prevent the Civil War, but he doesn't. So he goes east with Pompey, so again, he joined Caesar. Well, I guess that makes sense because remember, he uh, became Pompey's brother-in-law. I don't know exactly what it's called if your kids get married to each other. So he goes with Pompey, and Pompey rewards him by making him governor of Greece. But he grew ill and died shortly thereafter his arrival of natural causes. Apparently, he had been visiting Attica and he had some sort of premonition that he would die soon. They told him that he was destined for the hollows of Euboea, which is an island right off the coast of Attica. So he basically predicted his own death, then he fell ill and died pretty much immediately. And now to rank the oldest of the most famous generation of the Claudius family. So... Appius Claudius Pulcher, to me, is a D. He didn't really do that much, and aside from just joining on as a 
late uh, Johnny come lately to the Pompeian cause. There's not really that much to say about him politically. I mean, culturally, he's one of those guys who sort of has a hidden influence in the fact that, you know, as I said, Cicero has a huge outsized influence, and all the men who had an, a direct influence on Cicero's life and helped him form his ideas do have relevance in that way. But politically speaking, Appius Claudius Pulcher did not really do that much. His brother, however, did. Publius Clodius Pulcher famously eschewed his patrician heritage to become a plebeian so that he could run for tribune and do be the bagman of the triumvirate. And he did that pretty well, by the way. So he famously adopted himself into a plebeian family, which had a similar name, Clodius. And there actually are people who believe that Claudius is actually pronounced Clodius as well. Uh, actually, uh, there's a professor I know right now who believes that. Again, when it comes to Latin pronunciations, we don't really know. So, it's all guesswork. But, anyway, he went to someone, a, a, reg, a random plebeian named Clodius and had the guy adopt him so that he could now be eligible to run for Tribune. And he used his position to create a street gang. So, he is almost certainly the most... The, the Optimates always talked about the Tribunes being thuggish. Most of them actually weren't, but Clodius was. Clodius was the street gang leader they had always feared but never faced. And he often got himself in trouble. Clodius was a, a free spirit. Early as a youth, right after Caesar had been elected to Pontifex Maximus, uh, Clodius had decided that he wanted to visit his girlfriend while she was doing a religious ceremony. So Caesar held it at his house, and his wife oversaw it. It was a meeting of Roman noblewomen doing some ceremony or other. And apparently Clodius dressed up as a woman so he could get in and see his girlfriend, or maybe try to get with somebody. I don't know exactly what the idea was here. And also it was never proven beyond a doubt that he actually did this. But because he had gotten into Caesar's house in disguise, um, or the suspicion was that he had, there was a rumor that perhaps he was Caesar's wife's lover. So Caesar himself never really held a grudge about this and didn't think that it happened, at least as far as I can tell. Either that or he saw Clodius as too valuable to a shoe. So what he did is he just divorced his wife just on the off chance that something had happened because he didn't want to have his name solely because as Pontifex Maximus, he had to be beyond reproach when it came to his wife's chastity. Now, of course, Caesar himself could fuck anybody he wanted. And that was the double standard in Rome for a very long time, by the way. Even uh, Augustus's Lex Julia, which was a law about adultery, punished women for cheating on their husbands, but had no penalty at all for men who cheated on their wives. So, um, yeah. So Caesar just decided that he would play the safe route, and that's why the crisis blew over. Caesar could have made life miserable for Clodius, he didn't. And maybe that's why later on Clodius decided to throw in his lot with Caesar. Also, it looks like Appius Claudius, his older brother, had been more of a supporter of Caesar than anyone else. And despite being one of the oldest families in Rome and having been the arch-conservatives for a long time, ever since the time of the Gracchi, when an Appius Claudius Pulcher had sided with Tiberius Gracchus, um, he decided he uh, now this generation of Appius Claudius was still on the side of Caesar and the Populares. So um, he event he starts out as basically the bagman for the triumvirate, leading a street gang full of just street toughs and people like that. And he might have been the same guy who intimidated Bibulus, and then he picked up his activities the next year as he worked to prosecute Cicero. So he's also rising through the ranks at the same time that he's leading the street gang. Soon after he loses his office of tribune and his sacrosanct status, he keeps doing it. Later on, of course, he gets a rival named Milo. He also has falling outs at times with the triumvirate because he goes too far. And Pompey especially becomes not very comfortable with the street violence. So Clodius does have tension with Pompey quite a bit. 
And Caesar sometimes has to travel back or write letters to keep the peace. And Crassus sometimes plays peacemaker as well. And in many ways, it was Publius's street violence that helped to drive Pompey back into the arms of Metellus Scipio and others. So, of course, the street violence increases once Milo gets a gang. And things really got to, came to a head in 53 when Milo was running for consul. And, of course, Clodius didn't want to see that happen, so he started fighting Milo more and more. And things got bad enough that basically they declared an interregnum where Pompey took over for a time with Metellus Scipio and they sort of had martial law or something like it to let things die down. But shortly thereafter, uh, Clodius was coming back from a trip to the countryside. He had his gang with him and Milo happened to be there too. So they're outside of the city. It's more open and both of them want to avoid battle but some of their more ardent followers don't. So they basically have kind of an encounter battle in the street uh, in the on the Via Appia the the name name uh, the street name for one of uh, Clodius's ancestors and in this battle Clodius is mortally wounded and he's taken back to the city he dies and his followers are so outraged that they actually take his body to the senate house and use the whole building as a funeral pyre which is the coolest funeral ever and this is another event which really drives Pompey and the Optimates together because they're equally horrified and the Senate now has to meet in Pompey's theater because that's the only place big enough to hold them all. So uh, Clodius, to his credit, does very much shape the politics of the 50s. If I had to point out any figure who really determines what life is like in Rome, it's Clodius. He's the guy who creates this atmosphere of violence. It, it, I think forming the gang was pretty much his idea, if I'm not mistaken. Now, Caesar and Pompey and them sign off on it, but Clodius is the guy who actually goes out and makes this what it is. And he also takes the office of Tribune and makes it more powerful than it's ever been before. And, um, yeah, I mean, this was a guy who had sky-high ambitions, and had he lived long enough, this is someone who might have tried to become dictator by just killing his colleagues and like that. I mean, Clodius was very much a gangster senator, more, much more so than anyone else. I don't think he gave a shit about decorum. And uh, also, during both of his major scandals, there's another one in the 50s, and the, of course the Bonadilla scandal in the late 60s, his older brother had to try to cover up for him. So actually one of Appius Claudius' other skills is apologizing for his brother. So anyway, um, just because of pure effectiveness and getting what he wanted consistently... And being able to chart his own course, I'm actually going to put Publius Clodius as a B. Now, uh, make no mistake about it, both he and his opponent Milo actively made life worse for everyone around them. But if we're talking about uh, political effectiveness, they're, they're still pretty good. Now we move on to Titus Anius Milo. Sound check. And we're good. All right, back to the action. So, Milo effectively decided to be the anti-Clodius. Clodius had a gang, Milo formed one too, but his was in favor of the Optimates. And he, he formed the nucleus of his gang by recruiting gladiators, so he upped the ante. So after he formed his gang, Clodius had to enlarge and enhance his gang as well, and it was kind of an arms race about thugs. And, um, yeah, of course, Milo had strong backing from the Optimates. You might think that with the Optimates being obsessed with things like order and decorum and rank, they'd be horrified to be caught openly backing Milo, but you'd be wrong. They were completely fans of Milo. They were happy to support him and happy to promote him for high office. Uh, Milo nearly became consul with full support from the faction. So you might think that they would try to use him and throw him away. That they would try to discard him because he's an embarrassment. But in this case, no. Uh, they're very loyal to Milo. At least until the end, when he becomes too unpopular. So, unlike Clodius, he is a faction man. So Clodius tries to carve his own path at various times, but Milo is 
a steadfast optimate and does exactly that his entire career. Milo held the praetorship in 54, and it shows you how highly he stood with his colleagues because he married the daughter of Sulla, the old dictator, the guy who was the icon of the Optimates, the man who basically founded their faction. The, In a way, if you think about the Optimates as sort of like the Republicans of their era, then Sulla would be the Ronald Reagan. So this is like marrying Reagan's daughter. This would be a huge coup. And this also shows you just how desperate the Optimates were for a good leader in the, in the wake of Metellus Calaire's death. Because they look at Milo, who leads a street gang, and they say, maybe. Maybe that's the guy. The street gang leader. Yeah, him. That, there's the dignity of Rome. So, he is rising through the ranks. He's doing well, but Rome is not. He's running for consul. He and Clodius really start going after each other. They also try to prosecute each other a number of times, by the way. So Milo um, and he run into each other in the in the running battle outside the city. Clodius gets mortally wounded, as I mentioned. The Senate house gets burned down, and despite the fact that it wasn't truly Milo's fault, he does take the blame for this. And partly it's because Clodius isn't there anymore, so you can't blame him. Whereas Milo is there and has the only remaining organized gang. And the person who decides that Milo has outlived his usefulness is Pompey. So Milo tried to visit with Pompey after all this happened because he knew he was going to get prosecuted, and Pompey refused to meet with him. Because again, Pompey abhorred street violence. And unlike some of the other men who just saw uh, Milo as a partisan asset, Pompey was disgusted by him, just like he was with Clodius, and he was glad Clodius was dead wanted Milo to die too. So the Senate passes the final decree, which basically enables them to kill people at will. And um, Pompey decided to put Milo on trial in order to give himself some cover. And he selected both the prosecutor and the jury. So basically it was a rigged trial. Cicero defies Pompey for pretty much the first and only time ever and actually wants to defend Milo. Because again, Cicero is still desperate to try to win the affection and approval of the Optimates, even after all these years, even after all the snubs. So he's trying to go for one of their partisan heroes and protect him from a person who is sort of a wish-washy, a wish-wash ally at best. Wishy-washy, there we go. I've been talking for a long time. So anyway, um, before Cicero can deliver his final speech, however, the, Clodi- the pro-Clodius mob arrives and they basically threaten his life and pelt him with stuff. So Cicero leaves and basically Milo's convicted. Milo, just like any other Roman elite, decides to go into exile rather than be executed. And Cicero later mailed him a copy of the speech he was going to deliver, and Milo said it was a really good speech and said, you know what, I'm actually glad you didn't because I'm really enjoying the wine up here in Gaul. Uh, It's delicious. So apparently Milo probably went to Massilia, which was kind of the go-to place, modern Marseille for Romans in exile. Varys was still there, by the way, after being exiled all the way back in 70. So, in 48, it's 49, the Civil War breaks out, Milo stays out, but then in 48, he returns to Italy and decides to fight for the Pompeian cause. And he does so by joining with Cicero's protege, Caelius. And they try to lead a minor revolt in Italy against the government of Caesar, which is now undermanned in Rome because of Caesar being in Greece. But what happens is that their revolt fails even so, and both of them are killed. So, when it comes to Milo, it's undeniable that he served his purpose. He counteracted Clodius. Without Milo there, there would have been no counteracting Clodius, and basically Clodius would have just run roughshod. With Milo the Optimates actually were able to fight back and to hold their own, even. Despite the fact that Triumvirs still got most of what they wanted, they were still obstructed at times, and the Optimates did not fade into insignificance. And this is despite having a real leader. This is a disorganized mess of a faction, and they're still able to kind of hold their own a little bit, despite being against the three richest and most powerful men in Rome and their many supporters, including 
people of great note like Appius Claudius Pulcher and Lucius Caesar and some other guys who have their own wealth and power. So, actually, Milo's an A. Milo is the most effective of the Optimates during this time. His career doesn't end well, but uh, neither did Pompey's. But yeah, um, now again, what he did was not good for Rome. But uh, he did it pretty well. So I gotta give him credit where credit's due. Now, Clodius is of course cooler and more interesting, but Milo is probably more effective. Partly because Milo served a weaker cause and still managed to hold his own against Clodius. So that's actually why I'm being more generous to him, is because he did serve the weaker faction, but still managed to hold par. And he also had to kind of give his own marching orders, because again, the guys leading the faction were mostly morons. So Milo had to figure out how to make things work by himself, and whereas Clodius had people he could turn to and mostly spend his time butting heads with them, or at least half his time butting heads with them. That's probably a controversial take, I know. But, still, I think it's accurate. Alright, let's check sound one more time. We're almost done, or at least we're getting close to being done. Alright. Now we have... Lucius Aemilius Paulus. You'll probably recognize this name, at least the Aemilius Paulus part, because there was an Aemilius Paulus at Cannae, and then an Aemilius Paulus who conquered Macedon. This is one of those guys, except not as important. So Lucius Aemilius Paulus was consul in, in the year 50. Of course, his family's pretty famous, and his politics are pretty simple. He hates Pompey. That's it. Uh, and the reason is because Pompey had betrayed his father back in the year 77. His father must have been the elder Lepidus. And then he was adopted by another family because uh, the Emilii were related. So both Emilius Lepidus and Emilius Paulus would have been distant cousins. So most likely he is a brother of the future triumvir. So, he had a visceral hatred of Pompey, and that was his guiding principle. If that meant siding with Caesar, he'd do it. If it meant siding with the Optimates, that was cool. Basically, whatever Pompey was against, he was for. In the year 50, tension is now building between Caesar and Pompey as Caesar's command is coming to an end, and he's entering into tense negotiations with Pompey. So, Caesar wants to win all the allies he can, and one way that he does that is by spending money, by bribing people to take his side. So, he literally buys the support of a sitting consul. That's how rich Caesar became in Gaul. So one of his supporters went to Emilius Paulus and basically asked how much. They agreed upon a sum, the sum was delivered, and now you had one of the consuls taking up Caesar's side. And in order to try to justify the bribe, Emilius Paulus built a great basilica in the city. Later on, during the second triumvirate, he was prescribed, but then escaped because Lepidus spared him, most likely because, as I mentioned, they were brothers or possibly cousins, but they had to be related. He then fights under Brutus, and was pardoned again, surprisingly. I guess technically the first time he wasn't pardoned, so this was his first pardon. And he decided to live out the remainder of his own life in Miletus in Asia Minor. His son was then able to go to Rome and become consul under Augustus. So, the family lived on. He did not really wreck things too much. At the same time, this guy was completely ineffectual. And, um, he's an E. He's not quite a, he doesn't quite deserve his head in the box. He's basically just a greedy fool. Next up, we have a fan favorite, one of the greatest subordinate generals ever, one of the greatest Robins, the sort of Scotty Pippen of the conquest of Gaul, Titus Labinus. So, he actually began his life as a client of Pompey. He was tribune in 63, and he was the chief prosecutor of the old man Roscius. 
That's sort of his first claim to fame. Later on, he served as Praetor in 60 or 59, and after that, he went with Caesar to Gaul. Most likely, the reason why he went with Caesar is because he was sort of the representative of Pompey. But, despite the fact that he was a Pompey guy, he was quickly proved to be Caesar's best legate by a mile. And Caesar often had to entrust his legates with important tasks, but it was usually only Labinus who would get command of, say, three or four legions and be tasked with doing something major. And Labinus always delivered. So I think there's one part in the Gallic War where he takes three legions and marches through the area of Paris and wins a few battles on his own before meeting up with Caesar. So Labinus is the kind of guy who was valuable enough that I think it's safe to say without him, Caesar probably would have been defeated in Gaul at some point. So uh, Labinus, for that reason alone, has to be ranked highly. So now, he, when the Civil War breaks out, though, Caesar was a bit disappointed because he thought that he and Labinus had become close friends due to their working together for so many years. But instead, Labinus reverted to being a poppy guy. And this once again shows that despite the fact that Caesar was much more open to promoting new men and making them consul than the Optimates were, a lot of, for a lot of people there were other considerations. And um, Titus Labinus as a new man put, I guess, his principles or his personal loyalty above his career. So he sides with Pompey. Now despite being Caesar's number one subordinate for many years running, having a lot of insight in how Caesar fights and everything else, he was forgotten in the army in Greece. He was not utilized for anything, which is ridiculous. Uh, because, again, he's, he joined a faction where rank was everything. So when Pompey selected a group of men to raid and raise supplies and um, do all that kind of stuff, he selected Metellus Scipio. And Metellus Scipio not only failed to capture Caesar's raiding party, but he also almost got himself trapped and gave Caesar an advantage. So, if you imagine Labinus getting that little command, that could have been enough to change everything in that campaign. The whole course of the campaign would have been different. And Labinus would have been the obvious choice, but again, he can't be selected because there are so many other consuls there. He doesn't count, and he's a new man, so he's just not going to be selected. So, I don't know what his advice was at Pharsalus, but... I imagine he was smart enough to realize that Caesar had a fighting chance because he had so many veterans. He would have been the most likely person to speak up, but if so, he was too junior to make a difference. Pompey fights, loses. Now Labinus goes to Africa. Here he does a lot to help build that army with Cato and Afranius and Petrius and the rest. But again, it is all lost because Metellus Scipio takes command. Now, had Metellus Scipio, say, asserted his right, but then said, oh, I'm having a gout attack, I can't do it. Um, you're my legate, Labinus, why don't you take command while I go rest, and I will totally come and take command. So do the gout thing that Antonius Hybrida did to get your best general in command, and ignore the hierarchy, if you need to, to win a battle. If, say, if you literally think the Republic's fate and liberty itself is at stake, that's what you do. But you don't do that if you're Metellus Scipio, because you're a fucking moron. So, Titus Labinus, I believe, holds some small subordinate command during the battle. He escapes successfully, unlike many other people, and he escapes to Spain. And here, and only here, will he finally have a chance to come to blows with Caesar. Now, at this point, I don't remember if Pompey's oldest son is still alive. I think Pompey's oldest son might have met his fate here, actually. I did not include him on the list, and he's not really worth rating because he only had a very short career. But, um, yes, uh, Pompey's, Pompey's oldest son was at Munda, and uh, basically Labinus was still in command, though, because the younger Pompey had the sense to know that the best odds they had were with Labinus. Um, by all accounts, including Caesar's own account, or at least the account written on his behalf by one of his subordinates, this was the hardest fought battle in Caesar's entire career. And it, because Labinus is too smart to be taken by any kind of ruse, it was a straight slugfest. Caesar at one point had to shame his men in the charging uphill for the last assault. 
by saying, all right, I'm an old man, I'm charging up the hill, if you don't follow me, I'll just die alone, whatever. And then so the men followed him, they won, and also a number of Caesar's best units, including 10th Legion, had set out the campaign. So, um, yeah, Labinus came pretty close to beating Caesar, and this was not anywhere close to the best army Caesar had to face. So, Labinus is one of those guys, he, if there was anybody in that camp who could have beaten Caesar in a tactical battle other than Pompey, then it was Labinus. He wasn't given the chance, really, until it was too late. Overall, Labinus, for me, is an A. If, and that's balancing out military and politics. I'm, politically, I can't really blame him for anything, because, again, he, he was not the senior guy. And he was in a faction where basically his advice was just going to be shot down anyway because he didn't have enough uh, achievements formally. Um, but militarily, I mean, as a, a subordinate commander, he's an S tier. If, if there was a Hall of Fame for subordinate generals, he would definitely be at the head of that class. I can't think of anyone who's definitively a better subordinate general than Titus Labinus. Some people who are about as good, but no one who's better. Speaking of subordinate generals, let's talk about one who kind of sucked. Gaius Scribonius Curio. So, remember when I said that Caesar liked to buy men's loyalty at the end because he was looking for supporters in Rome to vote for him and make sure that there was no civil war? Well, he also bought another guy named Curio. And the way he did this is that Curio, like many young men, had gone into great debt trying to buy his way into politics, just like Caesar had earlier. So Caesar basically says, I will be your Crassus. All you got to do is be my guy. So he paid all of this young man's debts, and this man was elected as Tribune in 50, and tried his best to fight for Caesar. As Tribune, who's actually fairly effective in terms of trying to obstruct what the Senate was trying to do against Caesar. So he did keep that fight going a little longer, but ultimately, of course, the war broke out and his efforts were null and void. Here's where Caesar makes a mistake, though. Just because Curio was young, energetic, and um, loyal doesn't mean that he was a good general. Yet he gave Curio a legion or two and sent him to Africa. And Curio failed and lost those legions, dying in the process. Now, again... um, I mentioned that Caesar is a great general, but I don't think he's on the same level as someone like a Hannibal or an Alexander, precisely because there are certain mistakes he makes that they would not have. And this is one of them. Because there's no reason for us to think that Curio was qualified for this command. So, um, this failed, and later on, this commander who defeated Curio would be in a position to create a better army. And the army that the Senate assembled at Thapsus was a great one. Easily the best army Caesar had to fight in the Civil War. And it was built on the core of the men who had been captured, who had been Curio's guys, and the men who had been there originally. So, Curio, I'm tempted to put him in the box, actually. But as a tribune, he did do his job. So the question that I lay to you, ladies and gentlemen, or actually I've looked at the demographics, gentlemen, uh, should Curio be an E, or should we put his head in a box? Let me know. So E, or head in a box? Yeah, Curio was a bit over-aggressive. That is true. Um, well, I guess it's up to me, then. No one's answering. So, uh... Billy Chops... Box. Oh, I didn't know it was a box emoji. That's cool. Alright, um, looks like the consensus is with head in the box, and that's what I have in my notes, too, so I'm going to put his head in the box. So, uh, I, of all the people in the box so far, I think he's the strongest, though. So he's he's more competent. Well, I don't know, Franius, 
But see, that's the thing. Both Afranius and Curio are not complete losers. I mean, they, they failed spectacularly, but they're not complete losers. And when I eventually do the F-tier tournament, which, yes, it's still happening, uh, all these guys are now in it. So these guys might be... One of these guys might be a champion, so be on the lookout for that. Mattel Scipio, I mean, obviously he's not going to fucking win unless it's like a, a competition for how badly you can screw something up. Or a competition for just how lucky you can get for no reason. Um, so, the next guy I was going to cover here, but I decided not to because I didn't have enough time to do the proper research. That would be Gaius Fabius. Um, he was an important longtime legate of Caesar, who was active throughout a lot of the Gallic War, and he was the commander early on against Afranius in Spain. I'm going to hold off from talking about him or rating him just because I it's been a long time since I've read Caesar's commentaries cover to cover, and I don't want to misjudge this man, because he does appear a lot, and I didn't have time to go look up all of his appearances. So uh, we will actually skip... Gaius Fabius for now. By the way, I'm pretty sure he's actually not related to the more famous Fabius family. I think he was a new man who happened to have the same name. I might be wrong about that, though. But I imagine with Gaius Fabius, when I do revisit him, it will be Romans of renown, because he is someone who gets overlooked. And also, by the way, he has no uh, entry on Wikipedia, so far as I can tell. Which is odd, because he does appear a lot in the commentaries, but... Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll leave off on him for now, and I guess he'll be the next person I cover aside from Fulvius Flaccus, who I've been putting off forever now. Okay, next up we have Publius Atius Varus. I don't know if he's related to the Varus who lost the legions in the forest, by the way, so don't ask. Actually, we couldn't have been, right, because that Varus had a different name. Anyway. So, he was the Pompeian governor of Africa, and his claim to fame, of course, is defeating Curio and holding Africa, creating the circumstances uh, under which the Senate reconstructed a major army. For that deed alone, I think that he deserves a pretty good ranking. He was technically the commander despite the arrival of Afranius, who was a consul, and Labinus, who was a praetor, and... Um, Petrius was a praetor, and it was only when Metellus Scipio arrived that he demanded that Adius Varus hand over command. Because all these guys outranked Adius Varus, I'm pretty sure he was at most a praetor, and possibly less than that. So, but he had won a victory, and he had formed this army and done most of the work. But Metellus Scipio said, the command is mine, and ultimately Cato, despite hating Metellus Scipio, backed him up because Cato, once again, as a true optimate, was obsessed with hierarchy and valued that above competence. So, Adius Varus got no chance to lead the army that he built and to gain fame. Instead, later on, he fought a small naval battle, I believe off the coast of Spain, he lost, and then he took part at Munda under Labinus, and he died there. And because he had caused Caesar such harm, his head was delivered to Caesar along with Labinus's. So, uh, Publius Adius Varus, to me, is a B. He did a pretty solid job of serving the Pompeian cause. It's just that, well, Metella Scipio was there. What are you going to do? You cannot overcome that level of stupidity, no matter who you are. So, Adius Varus is one of those guys, he might have risen from obscurity to become one of the great Romans. What if he had actually fought and won the Battle of Thapsus as the commander? It's possible. Hell, he'd have done better than Metellus Scipio, have no doubt about that. I mean, he might have still lost, but he would have at least made it interesting. Alright. Next up, we have someone who might be a rival to Metellus Scipio for sheer stupidity. And that man is the cousin of the famous Cassius, the assassin, Quintus Cassius Longinus. So unlike his cousin, Quintus Cassius was a hardcore follower of Caesar and a guy who was someone else that Caesar showed poor judgment and rewarding. So after his conquest of Spain, Caesar appointed governors to the provinces there, and one of those governors was Quintus Cassius Longinus. 
The most likely Caesar was trying to reward his followers and looking for places he could send men who were defective that where they couldn't do any harm. And to be fair, Spain was now taken care of. It was a backwater. All he needed to do was keep order locally and pay the Pompeian troops to win over the loyalty, keep them from revolting. Not a big job. But Quintus Cassius was greedy. So he began to extort the people and began to incur great unpopularity. And his abuses were so bad that his own men, who might have been able to pocket some of this money, became disgusted with it. So effectively, his leading subordinate led a mutiny and kicked him out of the army. Uh, They did spare his life, but he he was forced to go into exile. He got to keep all his stuff, because of course, and he and his friends, who were trying to bleed the place dry, went with him. But their ship wrecked at the mouth of the Ebro River, and all the men on board died. Um, now, he did alienate people there so much, and he made, he gave people such a bad taste for Caesar, that he's almost single-handedly responsible for the province revolting in favor of the Pompeian cause, even after Pompey was dead. That's how bad this guy fucked up. So even after Caesar was clearly winning, Spain declared for him. And these these men decided to fight it out again, even though they had already accepted clemency and could not expect quarter, and there was no reason to believe that the Pompeian cause would win. So that's how badly this man fucked up. Now that I think about it, he's got to be at least as bad as Metellus Scipio. I mean, it's close. Uh... So, yeah, deified, obviously. Just kidding, his head goes in the box. Um, I I thought about doing deified for Metello Scipio as a joke, as a throwback to that time I put Elagabalus in the S tier. But I figured that someone would come along and be like, How could you say that? I can't believe you said that. You call yourself a historian. This is outrageous. Because that's what happened then. Because some people don't understand sarcasm, I guess. I don't know. I feel like it's pretty obvious when I'm being sarcastic, but... There are some people who seem to not be able to understand context clues at all. Anyway, moving on to Marcus Porcius Cato the Younger. I would say he's the most overrated of the men on this list. I've been implying that the whole time, and I stand by that. He is one of the most lionized figures of the late Republic, but a lot of his fame owes to two things. One is the unsatisfactory nature of the real leaders of the Optimates. We've looked at some of those guys. If you were a latter-day senatorial conservative, someone who dreamt of the old days when the Senate made its own rules and there was no emperor, would you think about, man, I wish I could follow Metellus Scipio. That'd be great. Or would you think, Cato the Younger, that guy had principles. I respect that. And if more men were like him, Rome would be so much better off today. That's the reason why he was looked at as being the leader of the Optimates, because he's more honorable, more relatable than the idiots who actually ran the faction. That's that's all it boils down to. In the early empire, they're looking for an icon for their movement, and there were still senators who whispered about, we should restore the Senate, and Cato the Younger was more appealing than, say, Metellus Criticus or... Whoever, I mean, most of these, Bibulus, for instance. Like, who else are you going to turn to? Well, Cato the Younger. Having never been in the position of power, he couldn't really fail at anything in a meaningful sense. He was sort of a moral leader, and he did impress his contemporaries quite a bit. But make no mistake about it, the Optimates were all about rank, and Cato was never more than a praetor. So when push came to shove, they would ask him to shut up, and he would. Because he also shared that principle and that obsession with hierarchy. So, in many ways, his principles were his biggest failing. Ironically enough. Even though that's what he became known for. Without the principles that made him ineffective in life, he could not have become a legend in death. But, although I will, I will say I do think he is more moral than most of his contemporaries, he's not a saint. Let's be clear about that. Very few people are, and certainly no one in politics. So at one point, uh, the Senate was using bribery to try to get Catiline not elected, to try to get somebody elected in his place. 
guess what? Uh, Cato signed off on that. So despite the fact that he loudly denounced anyone who used electoral bribery, that one time he did relent. Later on, or earlier in his life, he had that aforementioned romance scuffle with Metellus Scipio. And this is a grudge he held for life over a woman. Now, in theory, if you were a philosopher the way that people look at Cato now, you would let something like that go. Cato never did, though. Now, Cato was able to work through it and past it, but he never let that go. And in general, Cato definitely had a fucking temper. Remember, in 63, he tried to go after Caesar, as we talked about. He tried to accuse Caesar without any evidence whatsoever of being a Catalinarian. And he denounced him on the floor of the Senate and tried to rouse the Senate up as a mob against him. He also had the famous letter incident where he tried to catch Caesar and just found out about Caesar banging his sister. So, I mean, Cato, uh, he was not some calm representative of senatorial dignity. Now, he did keep to his principles, but the man had a temper and was not really the best leader in many ways. Cicero, I think, had it right. He said that Cato's problem, aside from being too stuffy and taking himself too seriously, is that he thought that he lived in Romul they thought that he lived in Plato's Republic rather than in Romulus's swamp. Cato simply did not understand political reality, or if he did understand it, he refused to abide by it. And that's part of why he never got to be consul. And by the way, once you become consul and you're in that senior you have that senior status, it is possible to be the man even if someone else say has been censored and you haven't. At that point, Cato might have actually had a chance to be the real leader of the Optimates. And who the hell else was going to stop him? Look at I mean look at the crowd we just went through. Who else would you have picked over him realistically? No one, cuz they all suck. Well, I mean, Metellus Calaire was effective, but uh, and Milo had his charms, I guess you could say, but uh, really, Cato would have stood head and shoulders above those guys, just, well, on principle, I guess you could say, right? I mean, uh, you're not going to go with, if you can go with someone other than a gang leader is what you do, and, I mean, Bibulus had been pretty ineffective, you don't want to back someone who's weak, uh, you don't want to back... Um, Metellus Scipio, what does he have going for him, really? So, yeah. All right. Another thing about Cato that's interesting is that he was militarily competent so far as we know. But because, again, his faction was obsessed with hierarchy, he got no chance to use those skills in the Civil War. And again, he needed to be consul, and he didn't get that distinction, so he never got to show off his talent. So, Cato, uh, in the mid-50s, had subdued Cyprus under a special commission created for him by Clodius, who just wanted him to get the hell out of Rome. So Clodius basically ordered Cato to Cyprus through the assembly, and he gave him a weird position where he was a keister with the powers of a praetor. So the position's an insult, and Cato of course, is very prickly about rank, so he interpreted it as such. But Cato did do his job, and not only did he deal with the problem on uh, Cyprus, but he dealt with it honorably. And rather than pocketing the money that he took, he took it back to Rome to the treasury. And the Senate wanted to honor him for this, because he took lemons and made lemonade. And he showed he actually is a man of ability. He's not just someone who's a hard-ass who refuses to play ball. But he refused any honors because he said, look, the command I got was bullshit and we all know it. There's no such thing as a keister with Praetorian powers and it came from Clodius who used the assembly and I don't believe in the people having rights. So, yeah, I don't, I'm not taking any honors for this. So, in 49, of course, Cato was against compromising with Caesar because he did not believe in compromise in general, which, in a way, I sort of respect, actually. And also, his, his position is pretty uh, predictable, because I mean, with Cato, you always know where he stands. He is a strict partisan. We should also keep that in mind. He's not a statesman. Um, he's not the kind of guy who would ever be above the fray in the truest sense. Now, he might be above a purely partisan fray, in the sense that if his own people 
do something he thinks is bad, he will call it out. But he is never truly above the fray. He's not like a George Washington type. Uh, he always he sort of has his position, and that's what he holds to every time. In that sense, Cato the Younger is basically the Ron Paul of his era. There's something to admire about him, but at the same time, his positions are predictable, and that makes him a little limited. Okay, um... Some good work that he did is that he... Well, okay, so he also was one of those guys who told Pompey to fight. But again, it's Cato, so you know exactly what he's going to say before he says it. No big surprise. He did pretty good work helping to organize the army in Africa. But of course, his biggest mistake in life was urging Metel Was basically agreeing that Metellus Scipio should be the commander. That's something that absolutely takes him down a whole letter grade, in my opinion. Huge mistake. Uh, because he had the opportunity, as the guy who represented all the principles of that movement, to make up some bullshit about uh, how Adius, Adius Varus had some sort of precedent or some sort of claim to it under some super obscure law from 342. I mean, he could have made up some real bullshit and run with it, and people would have taken him seriously because he's known for being smart and because he was known as someone with ironclad, unbreakable principles. But he decided not to. And again, this was the best chance his faction would have of defeating Caesar. And he allowed it to be put into the hands of the dumbest motherfucker in Rome. And a man he personally despised. Now, at the same time, this does show his principles. But those principles came at a very high price. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. So, Cato went off to govern the city of Utica. Whether he was sent there by Metellus because he doesn't like him or because he didn't want to be present when Metellus Scipio screwed the pooch, is unknown. But he's at Utica. News arrives that Daps has happened, and he knows that Caesar wants to pardon him above all. Because he and Caesar have been rivals for a while. Uh, back in 63, of course, there were rivals, and there were many who felt that the two of them were the most capable men in Rome. At least that was Sallust's take a generation later. And Cato did not want to be pardoned by Caesar because he knew that he would not be able to take that oath in good faith without breaking it. Or if he took the oath, he'd be forced to keep it, because then you know he can't go against his principle. So he decided to kill himself before Caesar got to him, and that's what he did. And again, I actually respect that. Um, I, I think, again, with, with Cato, I can't help but respect him, even if I think that he is kind of a fool. And I don't understand what some people see in him as a political exemplar, because again, we have to remember, Cato failed. Constantly. He didn't get any of what he wanted, ever. His, his career was constant failure. And the principles that he stood for were basically just defending oligarchical corruption. Even though he despised the corruption, he still defended it. Um, because he thought that his basic stance was that people, common people, should have no rights. I mean, that's, that to him was more important than his colleagues being held accountable. Even though he thought his colleagues should be held accountable, ultimately when push came to shove, he was willing to overlook all of their fuckery because he hated common people. So I don't really get the obsession with this guy. It makes no sense to me. But I do understand how people respect him on a personal level because the guy had his principles... And he literally did die for them. He even threw away the fucking Republic for those principles by letting Metellus Scipio take command. Um, originally, I was going to go with a C for Cato, but because of the Metellus Scipio factor that I wasn't thinking about when I wrote that down, I gotta go with D. Now, granted, Metellus Scipio could have taken command anyway. Wrong one. But, uh... Whoa. Too low. There we go. But Cato sort of made that a certainty. The other guys on the list we won't get to are Antony, Lepidus, Herdius, and Panza. And while these, I, what I wanted to do originally was cover these two guys in terms of what they accomplished in uh, the triumvirate period, or yeah, the first triumvirate period, but I never got around to that. Oh, I forgot to put, uh, never mind, that, that's why there's an extra icon here. Because our good friend Quintus Cassius, wait, no, 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 he did get there.
Uh, he got there. Who, am I, who did I not rank? Oh, Fabius. That's right. Guys, Fabius. So, we're officially done at long last, boys and girls. Those are my rankings, and I stand by them. Did any of you uh, have any disagreements with anything? Just curious if there's anybody you guys like. Uh, is there any? Are there any agree, any of these guys you super disagree with? Like you think that I totally fucked up on anything like that? Or I'm just curious because I haven't been reading the chat because I've been too busy dealing with this. But uh, and the reason why I was generous to Cato is largely because he didn't really have that much power, so his ability to fuck things up was pretty limited. I mean, Mark Anthony was pretty successful in this period. He was Caesar's chief subordinate, at least after Labinus left. And um, I think he would rank pretty well in this. I, what I might do next time when I do Second Triumvirate is I'll talk about what those two had accomplished, Lepidus and Antony, before the Second Triumvirate, and then come back and talk about what they did in the Second Triumvirate. Um, and then, of course, I'll have to double back for Gaius Fabius. And uh, Ponsa and Herdius won't take long, but I decided to wait because technically they served as consuls after Caesar was killed. Well, uh, Kaiser, the reason why I did not give him a special rank is because he... Uh, I don't know if he's that much worse than Quintus Cassius, honestly. Quintus Cassius was pretty, pretty trash. Uh, let's see. Nope, nothing showed up, of course. But yeah, what I'll do also is I'll save the Super Chats from this week for next week. Um, so, what would you have uh, ranked Labinus Backstreet? Alright, well... I'm about to leave. I got some other stuff I gotta do here. But thank you all for joining. I'm glad we got through that. It's probably been a little bit more fun with Sean here, so we could have made fun of a few of these guys in more detail, but uh, Sean wasn't feeling well, so he wasn't able to make it, but obviously you guys were. It's one of our higher turnout streams. I mean, I think the highest one ever was that uh, one on Ukraine. Forget what number. I think we hit 550 in that stream. This one, I think we maxed out around 250, maybe? But, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm pretty happy with how things went, and uh, I always enjoy talking about Romans, and all things ancient, so this was a lot of fun. I don't know when we'll get around to the second triumvirate. Another thing I want to do is, as I mentioned it before, the F-tier tournament where we have competitions between uh, our F-tier people in the past and see who's the best or the worst. And we'll have them engage in all kinds of stupid competitions to determine that. Alright, so anyway, everybody good night. Have a good week. Soon, very soon, I will have a video up on the Black Death, and I'll also be putting out a video this week on the Reformation. And after that, I will be free to make videos I actually want to make. So at that point, we'll have people like uh, Marcus uh, Fulvius Flaccus, maybe Fabius, this Fabius we talked about, and maybe, um, who else? Or what else? Uh, I had another idea. Oh, I want to do the Chagatai Conate. That's the other one I wanted to do in, soon. Um, yeah, we, we might use Metellus Scipio as a category in the future, now that we've established him, because I've only mentioned him sucking, but this is the first time I've actually described it in detail. So now that we've established how bad he is, we can actually use that as a category. Okay, so anyway, thank you all for joining me, and I hope you all have a good week. I'll be putting out a few more videos in the near future, and of course next week we're planning on doing a stream on the presidency of Franklin Pierce. So, that's all for now. Uh, see you all before next Sunday, but at the worst, we'll, I'll see you next Sunday.